Hello, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us here on ABS Television, ABS Radio, and ABS on our online platforms. A warm welcome to the Sandals Grand Antigua. You're now joining us for a massive consultation. It's the first public consultation on COVID-19 and vaccines, facts revealed. It's the first public consultation on COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Of course, one is being ruled out as we speak in the U.S., the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The Moderna is also seeking emergency use authorization as well. But as more and more vaccines are approved, of course, there is the need for public education and public discussion on the issue of vaccines. And that's exactly what the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment is doing right here at the Sandals Grand Antigua with the first consultation on vaccines. Without any further ado, we turn over to the head table and the chairman of this morning's proceedings, Dr. Linroy Christian. Dr. Christian. and the environment and uh, the Pan American Health Organization on the first public consultation in education with respect to the COVID-19 vaccine entitled The Facts Revealed. And of course, we have our panel today, which would range from the minister and our esteemed medical colleagues who will take you through the, the various presentations on this topic and we'll field questions both from in the room and online with respect to today's proceedings. But before we get into why we are here, please, if we could stand for the national anthem. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. May you please be seated. My name is Dr. Linroy Christian. I'll be your chairman today. Uh, welcome one and all to this uh, consultation. I would first like to recognize our honorable minister, Sir Marwin Joseph. Our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Randy Seeley Thomas, Dr. Lester Simon, our pathologist uh, here at the Mount St. John's Medical Center, and of course, our esteemed colleague, Dr. Lewis, who will be joining us here today. I welcome one and all, and thank you for taking the time out to be with us today to discuss this very important topic. And I have the task of introducing the individual speakers and to guide us through the proceedings for today. And first of all, we would like to welcome the Honorable Minister. First, let me share a brief introduction about the Minister. Uh, the Honorable Sir Marwin Joseph 
serves in the government of Antigua and Barbuda as Minister of Health, Wellness, and the Environment since 2014. While holding this significant portfolio, Minister Joseph has led his country down an environmental path, which has gained international recognition for the innovative and bold decisions with which his country has adopted. Mr. Joseph captained in Parliament the legislation that banned the importation and use of single-use plastic shopping bags, ending a history of the ubiquitous plastic scourge. The population of Antigua and Barbuda embraced the change following a vigorous campaign led by the Minister of the Environment. The Minister championed a similar effort with respect to styrofoam containing products. As the Minister responsible for health, Minister Joseph and his medical team have worked hard towards ensuring that mother-child transmission of HIV AIDS virus is at zero. This achievement was recognized by the Pan American Health Organization and a validation certificate was awarded to Antigua and Barbuda. PAHO has also determined that Minister Joseph's advocacy to suppress cigarette smoking across Antigua and Barbuda is deserving of a WHO award on No Tobacco Day 2019. Antigua and Barbuda was the very first state in the Eastern Caribbean to have taken such measures to discourage uh, smoking. The Honorable Sir Malwin Joseph has served as Minister of Finance, Tourism, and has held other portfolios during his 35 years in public service. And with that, I would like to welcome the Honorable Minister to the podium to give his opening remarks. Mr. Joseph. Thank you very much, Dr. Christian. Let me begin by saying good morning to everyone. I want to express my deep appreciation to Dr. Christian because only last night I called him after 10 o'clock and asked him ask if he would step into the breach as a result of the chairman designate I was unable to be here because of circumstances beyond her control. And so thank you, Dr. Christian. Let me make it very simple by stating the reason why we are here today. We are here today to engage some of our best minds in Antigua and Barbuda in answering the questions that are being raised by citizens of this country insofar as vaccines are concerned. The people of Antigua and Barbuda are desirous of straight talk. They would wish to engage the authority in clearly explaining the efficacy and safety of vaccines. To put it simple and straight to the point, we therefore in this first presentation, and there could be other uh, engagement in the public as we lead up to the eventual uh, distribution of vaccines in Antigua and Barbuda intend to persuade by using information, factual information, honestly discussed with no holes barred so that the people of Antigua and Barbuda can be confident with the information and the education that the government, having decided to make vaccines available, has done so respecting the people's wishes as well as to ensure that the people make decisions on the basis of facts. Now, I want to first of all recognize the individuals who have been at the front line 
And it's interesting that we're having this uh, public consultation, and I wish to uh, refer it more as a conversation with the public, because we need to have conversation with the citizens and residents of this country. That just last evening we learned of the death of one of our own, an employee of Mount St. John Medical Center. And I wish on behalf of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet of Antigua and Barbuda to express our condolences to the family. But that death has come at a time to remind us that we are still in a fierce battle with COVID. And this is no time for us to relax our vigilance and our guards. Since March the 10th, we have had the first case in Antigua and Barbuda. We have been designing responses to COVID. Initially, we had to close our borders. We had to get into a lockdown. And after a while, when we felt that we had stabilized the situation, we reopened our borders. And we learned a lot of lessons by reopening our borders. Having reopened our borders, we had to build capacity in order to protect the citizens and residents of this country. And I will take this time to express my appreciation to the, leaders, to the leaders in the Ministry of Health, Chief Medical Officer and her staff, to the leaders at Mount St. John Medical Center, the individuals who are directly involved in this response, have Dr. Simon, who when we started, we did not have laboratory capacity but he has worked with PAHO, and now we have at Mount St. John a laboratory functioning on its own, meeting the demands that was once carried by CAFA. I wish to recognize the outstanding work that has been done by the Mount St. John uh, Medical uh, Center. <clears throat> then, of course, the fight against COVID is a national fight. And we had to persuade the public of their role. And I would, without any reservation, say the compliance of the general public in Antigua has been outstanding. Many of the citizens of Antigua and Barbuda responded to the call of personal responsibility. And we must encourage them by recognizing the role they have played in this fight against COVID to the point where we've been able, in the main, to keep our uh, infectious, uh, active infectious rates in single digits. That is an outstanding achievement. Let me also mention the role of our partners, the Pan American Health Organization, was part of the panel that will be presented today. We have on our panel our Dr. Ron Seeley Thomas, who is our Chief Medical Officer. We have Dr. Lester Simon, consultant pathologist at Mount St. John Medical Center. We have Dr. Courtney Lewis, who is Assistant Professor at American University of Antigua, Medical Director, Dr. C. Lewis and Associates. We also have, as one of the presenters from the Pan American Health Organization, Dr. Filippo Molino Leon. And finally, the final panelist is John Fitzgerald of the Pan American Health Organization. I want to be very brief 
And that is to say that the next three months, in my estimation, will be the most challenging period in the fight of, against COVID. We are seeing what's happening in the UK, what's happening in Europe, and we are seeing what's happening in the United States of America. These are our source markets. Individuals will travel to Antigua and Barbuda from these source markets, which increases the level of risk. We have already seen a significant increase in traffic into Antigua and Barbuda from these source markets, and that also includes Canada. And we'll have to maintain our protocols and our approach to fighting COVID at least for the next three, four months. The mere idea that there is a vaccine does not suggest that we should relax our protocols. If I had to make a case, I would say that we should intense the, uh, the, the protocols that we, have, we already have in place. And so in as much as we are discussing vaccines today, we must do it in the context that it is at least three, four months away, and hence the protocols that we have adopted, wearing of masks, social distancing, practicing good hygiene etiquette, washing hands and sanitizing hands, and building your immune system are things that we will continue to encourage over the next several months until we have a vaccine in Antigua and Barbuda. There is fear. There is skepticism and maybe to some extent paranoia involved when some adults hear about vaccine. And the irony of it all is that the same adults who might be reluctant to take a vaccine benefited from vaccine as a baby or, or, or a youngster. But the difference is that the babies were not the ones who made the decision, were the parents. But vaccine today for COVID requires the parents, the adults, to make the decision. A decision perhaps for the first time in their adulthood. And hence, they're more critical in terms of the assessment, the evaluation, and one can understand that. So I would wish to encourage that we all respect the views of the public, understand that the public can be persuaded if they get the facts, the relevant information, and hence become educated about the vaccines or several vaccines. I'm sure that um, the chief medical officer will get into more details on power. My duty here this morning is to welcome you to this important exercise, encourage you to maintain your focus on being part of the process of helping Antigua and Barbuda to negotiate this decision of accepting vaccine that has proven to be efficacious for many years. Many lives have been saved. And I intend, as a minister, to declare publicly that I will take a vaccine when it becomes available. And so, in closing, I'd like you to join me in observing a moment of silence for our fallen employee at Mount St. John who succumbed to this dreadful disease COVID-19. Would you please stand and join me, join me for a moment of silence.
Thank you. I once again express my expectation that we will have a productive exchange today to lay the groundwork for future conversations with the public so that we all as a society can benefit from the innovations and technology that has sustained good health, not only in Antigua and Barbuda and the Americas, but throughout the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Joseph, for those words, and certainly laying the groundwork for what should be an inclusive discussion and thoughtful um, discourse on the matter of, of vaccines, and uh, certainly for the public to gain as much information as possible from those who are involved in the process such that we may make people more informed, and informed decision-making is always best. So with that, I would like to thank you, Minister, and move on to our next speaker, Dr. Rhonda Seeley Thomas, the Chief Medical Officer. Dr. Seeley Thomas is a graduate of the University of the West Indies, having graduated with a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery degree in 1993. She also holds a master's in public health and a doctorate in public health from the UWI. Dr. Seely Thomas has been employed by the Ministry of Health and Tegan Barbuda since 1995, initially as a physician at the Halberton Hospital and subsequently as the medical officer of health slash epidemiologist responsible for community health programs, including disease outbreak investigations. Currently, Dr. Seely Thomas is the chief medical officer of Antigua and Barbuda. As CMO, Dr. Steely Thomas is the Chief Technical Officer within the Ministry of Health, advising the government on public health policies. Dr. Steely Thomas, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Christian, and good morning to all. Good morning again to everyone. Let me recognize my colleague um, physicians in the room who are also members of the head table. Um, and of course, honor, um, the Honorable Minister of Health, Sir Marlon Joseph. We have Dr. Lester Simon, Dr. Lewis, good morning. And to other persons who are here in the room, warm greetings to you and thanks for um, joining us here this morning. And I also want to a, uh, make a special welcome to the persons who are joining us on the World Wide Web. Thanks to modern technology and because of COVID, everybody couldn't be here with us this morning. My task this morning is to provide an update on Antigua and Barbuda's response to COVID-19. Um, an outline of my presentation, I'll start off with an epidemiology of COVID-19 in Antigua and Barbuda. I'll speak briefly about the Ministry of Health response and the public health and social measures that we implemented and then I'll speak about vaccination in Antigua and Barbuda um, in terms of our readiness for COVID-19 vaccination. Epidemiology of COVID. Well, COVID-19 is a new disease. It started in um, what we think is Wuhan, China, as early as the 31st of December 2019 as a cluster of cases of viral pneumonia. It's a new coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, because we know, all know by now that there are other coronaviruses that we um, humans have been subjected to over the years, but the um, novel coronavirus is new, just developed, just just found in China in December of 2019. Uh, in terms of uh, the Caribbean, we have had about 307,232 cases of COVID, and for the rest of the world, as of December 31st, 2020, which was yesterday. The World Health Organization has said that there are about 70 million, just over 70 million cases globally, and just about 1.3 million deaths. 
In terms of Antigua and Barbuda, when we look closer to home, we had our first case of COVID-19, laboratory confirmed case, in March, March around March 10th or 11th of 2020. And in March, we had seven cases, a total of seven cases. As the EPI curve shows, we had essentially three peaks from March to December 2020. First peak was in April when we saw 18 cases, and then we had another peak in June. In May, we can see we only had one recorded case, and we can attribute that to the closure of our borders when we didn't have peak cases coming in. Because you remember that in, um, at the end of April, May, we um, actually restricted travel to commercial flights, and we had no um, pleasure craft coming into our seaports. So that would account for the drop in May. And then in June, we opened our borders on the 4th of, uh, well, in the on the 1st of June, we resumed commercial flights into the VC Bird International Airport. And we had our first flight on the 4th of June. And in June, we did see a record number of, in fact, the highest number of, of laboratory um, confirmed cases in Antigua and Barbuda at 42. In August, we saw a, 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 a decline. And then we had another peak in October of 2020 with 22 cases. To date, we, for September, we have seven confirmed cases of Antigua. This trend, if you look at other um, trends globally, is what they've been seeing. They, call, they speak about a, a first wave, a second wave, and a third wave. Similar situation in Antigua and Barbuda, where we are seeing peaks um, of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the epidemic. I'm not sure why it looks like that, but uh, I apologize. But when we look at our cases by gender, we have had just about 69 males and 79 females. To date, we've had 148 confirmed cases. So for the, in terms of percentage, 46.9% of our cases have been um, males and 53.1% have been females. So we have a slightly more um, number of females than males in terms of laboratory confirmed cases in Antigua and Barbuda. In terms of gender, this, this slide looks at age and gender. We have um, the most um, number of cases in the 25, the 34 year old age group, which is the, really the most productive sector in, in, our, um, in, our, in our country. The second most popular age group was the 45 to 50 year old age group where we had 32 cases. In the 25 to 34 year old age group, we actually had about um, 34 cases. And in the 45 to 50 year old age group, we had 32 cases. And then um, we've had no cases under the age of one. We had no infants with laboratory confirmed um, COVID-19. And in the, the youngest case we've had was a three-year-old male. And we've had a total of seven um, cases under the age of 14 years. Fortunately for us, we've not seen the complications that have been seen globally with children in terms of that severe immune response that children get. Um, we have not seen that in Antigua and Barbuda. In fact, none of the children, the seven children, have had to be hospitalized. The oldest case we had was a 77-year-old male. And we, do, uh, we are really concerned that we do have a number of cases presenting over 65 years. We've had nine cases in the 65 to 74-year-old age group and just two cases in the 75 to 84-year-old age group. And we do know that the elderly are more vulnerable to COVID-19 and its complications. The elderly, of course, because of their immune systems, and they're more um, likely to have chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, chronic heart disease, and cancer. And we've seen that um, persons succumb more to the complications of COVID-19 when they have those um, comorbidities of um, NCDs. In terms of travel history, um, uh, we've had persons with 42% of the persons who were confirmed with COVID have um, had no travel history, so that was persons who contracted disease in, in Antigua and Barbuda, and 58% of persons did have a travel history. So the majority of cases we see are persons who would have brought um, COVID-19 <coughs> into the country. In terms of symptoms, we know that by now that COVID-19 can pre present asymptomatically, that is, you're infected with disease, but you don't show any symptoms. Common symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath, diarrhea, loss of taste and smell. In terms of Antigua and Barbuda, about 59.2% of the population um, or the persons who were positive for COVID showed no symptoms. And 48.7% of them did have symptoms. That's significant because we realize now that there are a number of persons who 
can have the disease and don't have symptoms. And we have to really um, be vigilant in wearing our masks, practicing social distancing, because we're not sure who, because a person can be infected with COVID and not really show any symptoms. So we really have to um, rely on those uh, measures, public health measures, to make sure we don't become infected. Um, the common symptoms, as I said, fever, cough, headache, short throat, and diarrhea. In Antigua and Barbuda, for our COVID-19 cases, um, the, uh, about 38 of them presented with fever, 31 had cough, 18 headache, 12 sore throat, 12 diarrhea. Other symptoms that persons have presented with in Antigua and Barbuda include weakness, general malaise, and what we have noticed, a loss of taste and smell. And um, once, so in the Ministry of Health, our epidemiology and surveillance unit, that's a red flag. So once we have somebody presenting with a loss of taste and smell, they automatically get a swab. Because we find that that is something that has been quite peculiar to COVID-19. COVID-related deaths. So far, we've had five COVID-related deaths in Antigua and Barbuda, four males and one female. And let me join the minister. Thank you. So let me join the minister in sending out condolence, extending condolences to the family of the latest case of COVID-19 that passed away, who passed away. So as I said, we've had five COVID-related deaths so far, four males and one female. The youngest person who died from COVID in Antigua and Barbuda is a 46-year-old female. The oldest person is a 77-year-old male. All the cases that who have died have had some comorbidities, be it asthma, diabetes, hypertension, um, renal disease, um, asthma, as I mentioned. So how is COVID-19 managed? There's no definitive treatment for COVID-19. We know there have been experimental um, medication that could have been used, but so far there's no definitive treatment for COVID-19. There's no cure for COVID-19. How we manage COVID-19 is that we manage the symptoms. Persons, are, if they have fever, if they have shortness of breath, they may need to get um, antipyretics. If they have shortness of breath, they may need to um, get supplemental oxygen. And of course, in critical or severe cases, patients also need to be ventilated because COVID-19 has an affinity for the lungs and can reduce lung capacity. And in addition to those, uh, the management of the symptoms of COVID-19, what is critical, because there's no treatment, there's no cure, Public health and social measures are recommended to prevent disease, limit transmission, and reduce morbidity and mortality. And then, in terms of, although we can't um, cure or treat COVID definitively, although we only have to, we can only manage the symptoms, and we've been doing that in Antigua and Barbuda at the Mount St. John Medical Center. And just very briefly to say that in the initial stages, stages of the outbreak in Antigua and Barbuda, the Mount St. John Medical Center had to adapt very quickly, change their policies, their procedures in terms of elective cases. Those had to be um, canceled or postponed. Um, limit, we had to limit visiting hours at the hospital. And we actually had to create a COVID ward in the hospital. And you can see here, yeah, there's a section of the hospital that actually was reserved for um, for COVID cases, we had to limit the amount of admissions and staff had to reorient um, the way they treat patients and treat um, only COVID patients, suspected or confirmed cases of COVID. Um, at Mount St. John as well, they also had to find very innovative ways to treat COVID-19 because of the way um, the, of the disease transmission. And one of those things was the fact that they had to get a design, in, in essence, a particular device to, to intubate patients to protect both the healthcare provider and the patient. And that's just a snapshot of you know, one of the things that they had to do at the Mount St. John Medical Center to deal with the management of COVID. And of course, um, we did uh, commission an infectious disease center 
at the Old Halberton compound on the 27th of April 2020. And the concept of the IDC actually came around when we were preparing for Ebola. And we were able to, because of COVID, we had to quickly complete our plans to, to establish an infectious disease center. We have a 17-bed um, facility there with living quarters for uh, medical staff. And since the outbreak of COVID in, in Antigua and Barbuda, we have housed and managed um, patients in, at the IDC. I want to take the opportunity in joining the Honorable Sir Marvin Joseph in congratulating Mount St. John and the work they've done and to thank them, particularly the lab, for the support they've given in our fight against COVID-19 in Antigua and Barbuda. What are some of those public health and social measures? So yes, we have the hospital, we have the IDC, but as I said before, there's no treatment, or there's no cure for COVID-19 at this point in time. So public health and social measures are what really, all we have right now in our arsenal to fight COVID-19. And what are those public health and social measures? Personal protective measures, hand washing. We can't say that enough. Respiratory etiquette, coughing into a tissue or sneezing into a tissue and disposing of it properly and washing your hands after. Wearing of masks to protect the person who's wearing the mask because when you wear a mask, you actually protect yourself from the, from the, the virus getting into your system, but you also protect the person you're speaking to or you're interacting with because, that, because the particles are not expelled when you sneeze or cough or when you speak or when you sing. Environmental measures, of course, and the Central Board of Health have to be commended in terms of cleaning, disinfection, ventilation. They work tirelessly with our barbershops, restaurants, our hotels to make sure that the env environmental measures are in place to protect us against COVID. Surveillance and response. Testing, we've moved, as the um, Minister, Honorable Minister stated, we were unable to do um, PCR testing, real-time PCR testing here in Antigua and Barbuda, and we had to um, depend on the Caribbean Public Health Agency for CAFA for testing. And, um, but we've increased our capacity, as the Minister said, and we can now do PCR testing in Antigua and Barbuda. We still use CAFA as our reference lab, of course. Contact tracing has been critical as a public health measure for the fight against COVID. And contact tracing means essentially when we have a case, we have to go out and actively find persons um, who might have been in contact with that case, quarantine them, do testing on them, and isolate them if they become positive. And quarantine, of course, which we use for well persons, persons who we suspect might have been exposed to disease, the disease, and put them in quarantine for 14 days so that, and monitor them to make sure that they don't develop any symptoms of COVID-19. These are some of the public health measures that we have been using in Antigua and Barbuda. And I dare say some of the public health measures that have worked to keep our numbers to the level that they are. Physical distancing, of course, maintaining at least six feet between persons because we have learned always a new disease that it can be spread from person to person. Um, but by maintaining a, a distance of six feet, you can limit the impact of, of COVID-19. And social distancing, we have to limit the type of gatherings we have. So we know, all know that schools have to be closed in Antigua and Barbuda. That was a, a social uh, measure that we took to limit the spread of COVID-19 in our school population. Church services, we've all, um, I think, suffered from not having to go to church in our usual numbers. Funerals have had to be limited in numbers. Weddings have had to be postponed. Parties have had to be suspended or limited and work, of course, we initially had a lockdown where most persons had to remain at home. And even now, some persons still have to work from home because of COVID-19. We did have some international travel-related measures, including um, the closure of, not the closure of the airport, really, because the airport never really closed. But what happened was we limited um, the commercial flights coming into the VC Bird International Airport. Our borders had to remain open critical um, persons had to leave the country and enter the country and also our, our seaport had to be open, of course, for cargo vessels. And of course, one very important, the seventh very important public health measure that can help us in the fight about in COVID-19 is vaccination. Before I move to vaccination, I just want to speak briefly about the international travel related measures. As I mentioned before, in June, we started, um, restarted commercial flights and between June and October 31st, we set up a team at the airport that processed over 30,000 passengers 
and we also had the capacity to do t um, swabbing at the doing nasopharyngeal swabs, and we've taken, by this time, over 1,000 nasopharyngeal swabs at the airport. The snapshot just shows um, some of the activity at the airport. We have a thermal scanner where we screen persons coming in, check their temperatures. This is, I do, um, this was the arrival hall that would, before, previous to COVID-19, had no um, activity at all, and we've had to install stations and the thermal cameras I mentioned before in order to screen persons coming into Antigua and Barbuda. This is, uh, these are members of the staff of, Anti of the Ministry of Health who have been working at those um, booths at the airport. And I want to say thank you to all of them from the, since the flights came in in June at 11.15 p.m. every night. The staff, we've had a team who've been going tirelessly to the airport to conduct screening. And I want to take the opportunity to thank them for their effort. And um, in transportation and emergency response, we've had to have a whole suite obtain an additional suite of vehicles. We've had to have de de dedicated ambulances for suspected and confirmed cases. We've had two mobile swabbing teams. So when we need to have persons swabbed, we actually have a th uh, two teams, and mobile units who go out to private physicians' offices, persons' homes, and they do the swabbing. We've had, um, since we opened our schools, we had to plan with the Ministry of Education for in the, in the event of any child or teacher who would have become ill. And we have a rapid response vehicle that's dedicated just to the school population. And we have dedicated vehicles, of course, for transportation of samples. As you would understand, we have to take samples from the airport when we swap persons to the lab. We also have to take samples from private physicians' offices to the lab. And we have to take samples from Mount St. John Medical Center to the airport when they go over to CAFA, the Caribbean Public Health um, Agency, that remains as our reference laboratory. So I want to thank the Emergency Medical Services under the directorship of um, Mr. Greenwich and his team for the support they've given in our COVID-19 response. Vaccination. The public health measure that I believe, I'm convinced, will help to save us from COVID-19. Vaccination has been a part of Antigua and Barbuda since inception of Pan American Health Organization's expanded program on immunization since the late 1970s. Initially, we focused on five diseases, measles, poliomyelitis, diphtheria, pertussis or whooping cough, and tetanus. Our program, all, in addition to those diseases, we, it now includes mumps, rubella, hepatitis B, hemophilus, influenza type B. And this is just a snapshot of our vaccination schedule Vaccines are administered in the public and private sectors. We have a network of 26 community health clinics where we um, do administer vaccines. Yes, we have main health centers and we also have sub-centers uh, where we are able to conduct child health clinics where vaccinations are given. And there are also private clinics in Antigua and Barbuda that the Ministry of Health monitors, who all, they also give um, vaccines. Other vaccines that we give that are not included in the regular schedule for children, influenza, we do administer seasonal influenza vaccines in Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, human papillomavirus, the HPV virus that is very, um, has been proven to prevent cervical cancer, anal cancer, anal warts, and uh, cancers of the, of the throat. We do have human papillomavirus that is offered to um, the population, particularly teenagers in Antigua and Barbuda. We have meningococcal vaccines, we have the varicella or chickenpox vaccine that's also given yellow fever and pneumococcal vaccine. I wanted to speak a little bit about, I think, four diseases, poliomyelitis, and a lot of people, especially the younger population, may not be aware of polio. It's a debilitating disease that's caused by the polio virus. It causes muscle weakness and flaccid paralysis and complications, the paralysis can lead to disability, persons are unable to walk, skeletal deformities, and it can also cause death. These pictures show children way back before we had a, a, a polio vaccine, some of the complications, many of them are, have visible deformities, some of them are unable to walk without the assistance of crutches. Over the years, vaccination with the polio virus for the, for the polio virus has led to a reduction in the complications of polio. A lot of persons don't remember that this is what was happening to our children many, many years ago, before 
COVID before there was a va vaccine for polio. If you look at rubella, rubella is caused by a virus, and when a pregnant woman contracts rubella in pregnancy, the virus can be passed to the fetus, and we end up with something called congenital rubella syndrome. What that is essentially, the, the child is born, if the child is born, because if the mother contracts rubella, there can be a spontaneous abortion as well. But if the child comes to term and is born, the child can have microcephaly. That means we have a small brain, heart disease. We also have um, ophthalmic complications. It will include cataract, cataracts, glaucoma, strabismus, nystigmus, and other diseases of the eyes that can call, affect that child's ability to see properly. And of course, we know that congenital rubella syndrome can also result in deafness. It can affect the auditory system. With the advent of a viral, uh, vaccine for rubella, congenital rubella syndrome is virtually non-existent. We have a vaccine that if women are exposed to it, they will not contract rubella and they will not pass the virus to the fetus and a child will not be born with these complications. That is a positive, um, one of the positives of vaccination that a lot of people are not aware of. Imagine having a child born with a cataract, a child is blind, a child is not able to hear, or a mother, a woman who is pregnant develops rubella and, has a, uh, and ends up with fetal demise. The, vir the vaccine for rubella prevents those complications from happening. Tetanus, you all know about tetanus. You get a stick with a nail and the uh, bacteria, the tetanus, the clostridium, um, it enters the wound and the bacteria actually produces a toxin and that toxin affects the nervous system, particularly the, the nervous system and muscles in the, in the neck, in the back and in the jaw and causes severe spasms and um, a persons might be more familiar with lockjaw, or it, it, it causes spasms of the, of the muscles in the lungs and leads to death. This is a baby, a picture of a child born with tetanus, and you can see the arching and the, the, the um, contraction of the child, of the, of the fetus, of the, not the fetus, the baby. Tetanus vaccine prevents this from happening. Tetanus vaccine prevents lockjaw. And a lot, how many of us in the room here would have gotten a nail stick sometime or a cut? Once you get a stick or a cut and soil or it's, uh, uh, the bacteria gets to enter your body, you are susceptible to, to developing tetanus. But because you've been vaccinated against tetanus, you don't develop that complication. And measles. Measles is a viral disease. There's no cure for measles. It's extremely contagious. And in 1980, 2.6 million persons died from measles. The measles vaccine that is administered worldwide and in our, is in our vaccination ske um, schedule prevents measles and has resulted in a reduction of deaths from measles between 2000 and 2017. The picture here is a child with measles, very characteristic rash. Uh, you know, but there's all, can also be vomiting, upper respiratory tract um, symptoms, um, spots in the mouth that physicians know, know that, that we can look for. So, and, and as I said, 2.6 million persons died from measles in 1980. Because there's a vaccine, there's been a reduction in the number of cases of measles globally. And in Antigua and Barbuda, in our vaccination schedule, we have uh, about between 96 now and 98% coverage for these vaccine preventable diseases. So we don't see measles in Antigua and Barbuda, except of course in, nine, in 2018, in spite of our measles elimination, there was an imported case of measles in Antigua and Barbuda in January 2018. We had a visitor from the United Kingdom who had never been vaccinated against measles. And she and her sibling contracted measles in the UK, but she still decided to board a plane, come to Antigua for vacation. Due to the diligence of one of our physicians in our community health services, 
although he had never seen a case of measles himself because of his age, he picked it up and contacted the Ministry of Health. And we did a very intense investigation by our team, and we were able to not have any secondary cases of measles. That is, that we were able to stop that person from transmitting measles to our population. Why? Because of the rapid response of our team, the person was staying in a hotel, so we had cooperation from the hotel. But most importantly, more than 98% of our population had been vaccinated against measles. So that person came, interacted with immigration, customs, taxi, went to a pharmacy, went to a private physician and interacted with hotel staff. Measles is highly contagious, but we had no secondary cases. And I believe, I know, that that was because of the high vaccination coverage for measles in our population. Because some, a person who would have come in contact with that, per, with that case, if they were, if since they were immunized against measles or vaccinated against measles, their body was, would have been able to um, prevent them from developing the disease. So successes, we've had no, no, you know, no cases of yellow fever, polio. Of course, we had that one imported case of measles in 2018, but in 1994, we joined regions of the, Car of Car the Caribbean in eliminating diphtheria. We've had no cases of congenital rubella syndrome, neonatal tetanus, and rubella. Why the success? What are the reasons for our vaccination success in Antigua and Barbuda? And we have been successful. We have committed healthcare professionals. We have an expanded program of, on immunization. We have EPI manager that is led by our superintendent of public health nurses over the years. And I want to recognize Nurse Coates, who's here now, our current EPI manager. I want to recognize her and her team for the work that they've done and other EPI managers have done for our successful program in Antigua. We have the technical expertise and guidance from PAHO. Always PAHO is there to assist us. When we had our, uh, that imported case of measles, PAHO was very instrumental in our response. We also have the guarantee of safe, effective vaccines at an affordable rate through PAHO's unique financing mechanism, the PAHO Revolving Fund, which is a best practice for the Americas. What that means is that we, pro we provide funding into our revolving fund and the funds that we provide um, allow us to procure vaccines. So PAHO pools their resources and gets a very good price for vaccines. And PAHO has the, um, because it's a, an arm of the World Health Organization, they have all the technicians and um, persons who need it to make sure that our vaccines are safe. And of course, our vaccination success could only be done as well with the cooperation of the public, the mothers who come in with their child on a regular basis to make sure that their children are vaccinated. Um, we couldn't do it without them. We can have all the vaccines, we can have all the committed um, healthcare workers and technical expertise and guidance, but if the public, if we don't have the buy-in from the public, um, we would not have a successful program. So it's my hope that the same can happen with um, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, also, very, very important, one of the other reasons for vaccination success is the cold chain. And the cold chain is a, a, a mechanism whereby we ensure in Antigua and Barbuda that our vaccines are kept at the right temperature from, from the manufacturing to um, when it is given to our patients. And we, we know that vaccines have to be stored at a particular temperature, particularly now with COVID, and that will be discussed later. Um, the, the temperature requirements for, for COVID-19 vaccines. But just to say, since this 1970s, we have been able to maintain the cold chain for our vaccines. We are alerted when the vaccines come into the airport, day or night, someone is there to pick them up. We maintain the, the temperature from the airport to storage. This is just a snapshot of our current storage facility at Barnacle Point, where we have our freezers or refrigerators dedicated to vaccine storage. And you can see on the refrigerator, each refrigerator has a, um, a document that I, where the temperature is recorded on a regular basis so we know that um, what the temperature is like to, and we maintain the integrity. Our nurses go out with flasks, with ice, with dry ice to make sure that um, our vaccines are kept at the right temperature. So the, maintaining the cold chain is part of our immunization program. It's what we do. And it's something that the nurses and other healthcare providers pay 
very, very, very close attention to, to main, maintain the integrity of our vaccines. So the COVID-19 pandemic and vaccination. COVID-19 can now become a vaccine preventable disease like measles, rubella, and polio. We can use the commitment and dedication of our healthcare workers and technical guidance and financing strategies from PAHO WHO, and we can successfully use those to eliminate these and other diseases to fight COVID-19 in Antigua and Barbuda. Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you for your attention and for the opportunity to present. Uh, I put this picture here of grandparents with grandchildren. Let us continue to keep them safe. Let us get back to the point where we can interact with our friends, with our family, without masks and without social distancing. Vaccination for COVID-19 can assist us in doing that. I really want to thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. C.D. Thomas, for that presentation. I think pretty much sets the tone for the discussion today, uh, showing the efficacy of previous vaccines and how these have been uh, instrumental in, in human development. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Lester Simon, consultant pathologist at the Mount St. John's Medical Center, and of course, leading the testing regime here in Antigua and Barbuda as head of the Mount St. John's Medical Lab. Dr. Simon attained his MBBS from the University of the West Indies, another UE graduate, and his postgraduate degree in pathology in 1982 from the same institution. 1983, he became the government consultant pathologist and laboratory director in Antigua and Barbuda. In 1987, he received a diploma in clinical pathology, immunology and hematology from the University of London after one year at Hammersmith Hospital in London. After stints as visiting senior registrar at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, England, in 1997 he received a diploma from the Royal College of Pathologists at the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel. 2006, he was invested as a Grand Officer of the Most Illustrious Order of Merit, GOM of Antigua and Barbuda. Dr. Simon is also an avid musician, the examination passes and practical band experience um, in the full complement of woodwind instruments. He and his wife, Norma, are owners of the MedPath Clinical Laboratory and uh, Healthy Choice FM Radio. The laboratory was the first private local business to fully engage the public in health education from its opening in 1991. The radio station starting in 2015 is a progression to a more extensive form of health education, although it's secretly guarded as, as an excuse to play jazz music. Dr. and Mrs. Simon have two children, Suwandi, who is a medical doctor and musician, and Sabria, a psychologist, photographer, and wellness coach. They're also blessed with one beautiful granddaughter, a son, Shade. So with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Simon to give his presentation.
go. Today is getting a lot of feedback. Stop sure for now. Who is this? I have muted him. That's what. Huh? That's you. Well, that's there because she's like the convener. Okay. Nobody else is on her. No, no. Uh, good morning. I recognize the protocol established. I've been asked to speak to you on vaccines. What is a vaccine? How do they work? And their side effects. When we talk about immunization and vaccination, we are essentially talking about a medical product against an infectious agent. If the goal is providing an enhancing protection, we are talking about immunization. If the goal is to elicit a protective response, then that is vaccination. So there's a subtle difference between the two, but we use them as if they're one and, one and the same. We see a, a subtle difference as we go on a little further. The history of vaccine, essential dogma I was taught in school, and I still believe that is true, although there's an addition to it, is that the whole thing was invented by Edward Jenner, an Englishman, in 1796. Um, Jenner knew that milkmaids who had contracted cowpox from the cows they were milking, never got smallpox. And he actually inoculated a boy with secretions from cowpox sores and showed that the boy was immune to smallpox. And this is why we have the term vaccination from the Latin vaca for cow. There's also vaca from the Spanish for cow as well. However, at that time, as no, it's not that everyone accepted that process that Jenner um, was carrying out. In fact, there were cartoons and a lot of ridicule and a lot of resistance to vaccine from its inception, or that inception that we know of. I say that inception because when you look further in history, we see that there was the deliberate inoculation of people with secretions from smallpox sores by inhaling the dried secretion or rubbing the dry secretion onto the broken skin. And this was actually used for centuries in Asia and in Africa to the extent that an African slave, Onesimus, was instrumental in saving many lives by showing how this process could be carried out in Boston um, with a smallpox outbreak there in Boston in 1721, decades before Jenner's, Jenner's work. But at a more appropriate place and time, we will draw a perpendicular from works like this to the demand for the redistribution of healthcare, goods and services, as well as other faculties of a good life, in fact, of a normal life through reparations. But that's a story for another time and place. The immune system comprises two arms, the innate immunity, which is a basic primal primitive, if you wish, immune system. Very important, yes. It involves barriers like skin, acid in your stomach, the lining, the special lining of your respiratory tract. It involves certain substances like lysozymes that lyse or destroy certain products. It involves things like interferon. Interferon was actually mentioned by Bob Rogers in the 1960s in a comic strip. Some guys were stuck somewhere in, in space and wanted, you know, they picked up something there. So science fiction actually became um, science fact which is something we are increasingly familiar with. But in addition to those humoral or liquid aspect of innate immunity, there's a cellular aspect. We all learned in school, the red cells carry oxygen and carbon dioxide, the white cells fight infections, and the platelets are involved in clotting. Well, the white cells 
like air defense force has many subsets and these subsets do various various things and that's the basic innate immunity but we also have something called specific or special immunity and what's special about it it is that it is specific for, for a particular agent now this degree of being specific actually varies and this is why Jenna was able to use the cowpox to protect against the smallpox because there's a similarity there so though we talk about specific immunity the degree of it being specific is not always that great it, it varies and this can have implications which you can talk about um, later the other key thing about specific immunity is that it has what we refer to as immunological memory yes there are cells in your body that remember the agents that um, that that come in and try to do you harm. So we have innate immunity and we have adaptive or specific immunity. The key thing about the adaptive or specific immunity is that you have agents, you have, sorry, you have antigens, which are the agents that enter the body, either as part of a virus or maybe just some abnormal protein. They're usually a protein. So those are the bad guys, the antigens. And the body makes antibodies against the antigen. And the whole idea is for the antibodies to fight with the antigen, sequester them, and deal with them in that, in that particular way. But antibodies are just one part of the special immunity. There are cellular aspects to this immunity, because antibodies are substances. And in fact, you do have in your body some cells that are very dangerous, naturally man-made, sorry, naturally in your body, not man-made, um, called cytotoxic or killer, C, killer uh, uh, um, T cells. So there's a, a bit of a war that takes place between invading agent and your body response. I make this point because later on we can see how this invasion can lead to, to certain issues, certain side effects. This graph is of absolute import. If you follow the blue line, along the horizontal axis is time, and the vertical axis is antibody concentration. If you pick up an infection at time zero, it takes time, in this case around seven days, for the antibody level to start to rise. You see implications for that right away, because if you're testing for antibodies, you can see if you do the test too early, your test is going to be negative. But we'll get into that some other time. The antibody starts to rise, and then after a certain level, it falls. If you contract that particular virus, or that particular agent could be a bacteria, or it could just be some protein, like pollens, for example, on a subsequent occasion, like say day 28, it's different. The response is quicker, takes a quicker time, a shorter time for you to respond. The response is higher, following the blue line, and the response lasts for a longer period of time. Uh, and this is why you have to get your booster so that you can have these memory cells, these protective agents present at, at, a, a certain, at certain levels. And this is what you'd expect for something that's specific or something that is good. Something happens to you once, somebody said something to you, or a dog rushes out at you. At some other time, you're prepared and you respond quicker. The, the response is heightened and the response lasts for, for a long time. The only silly thing about that is that if the response is specific to a particular dog, you're not, you should not, in fact, respond to a, a, another dog. But the analogy is, is, not, is, not, is not perfect. Now, let's get into active and passive immunity so we can see how the body handles things. Uh, we could start with immunity can either be active or passive or it could be natural or artificial. If you start where active and natural meet, and you can see that is where you pick up an infection, whether it has to do with COVID or the flu or whatever. The effect of that may be clinical, you have signs and symptoms, or it may be subclinical. So that's active immunity because you have naturally you have gone about your business, you have naturally picked up this virus, and you actively make a response to it. If you move to the right and you look at passive immunity, passive suggests that you're not making anything, but you're naturally receiving some sort of protection. And this is what happens to the fetus by way of the, um, getting protection of antibodies via the placenta, or the baby getting protection via antibodies from breast milk. If you come down to the right, you can have passive artificial immunity, which means that you're not making anything. You simply get artificially by way of an injection, for example, the protective product like immune serum and, or immune cells. That's already 
ready to work, as it were. So you're not really eliciting a response. The response is their package and given to you. So if you come to the last one now, which is active artificial immunity, that is where vaccination is. Because you are now artificially getting a product, and we'll soon show you later on what those products can be, or the form those products can take. And you are eliciting a response. In fact, I can tell you as it is listed here now that that product you're getting could be a live virus, a killed virus, or attenuated virus, or a purified antigen, and then you make the response to, uh, respond to it. So that is what vaccination is, as opposed to if you go to the right from vaccination, that is basically I I immunization. But again, that's just splitting hairs unnecessarily. So vaccines are created from either killed bacteria, because we do vaccinate against bacteria, as I see or I mentioned, uh, or viruses or fragments of protein from these microbes. The proteins are recognized as antigens by our immune system, and the antigens are the bad guys. And this causes a mild immune response. So you have memory cells, B cells, and T cells that are ready to fight off the illness that you would, you would get otherwise if you were not protected. Now, this is just the last, the next three slides are just to show you that over, when you look at all the vaccines that we have had, it can either be, as far as the viruses are concerned, it can be live. Certain strains are actually grown, so it's, 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 it's live, but it's, it's a particular strain. Or you can have live attenuated um, vaccine. You can have inactivated vaccine. You can have recombinant vaccine. Recombinant is a very important term which we will develop in the discussion because we have to understand and appreciate recombinant DNA and RNA te technology to understand the new technology messenger RNA because we have been with this technology for quite some time. So what is happening now is not something that just dropped out of the sky or just turned the corner. We've been on a pathway of molecular biology. In fact, I have to mention a lot of people don't recognize it that we have the so Michael <laughs> medical uh, <laughs> Um, biologist, um, molecular biologist in, in Antigua in the form of um, Dr. Dr. Christian, that's the appropriate person for such, for such an occasion. Uh, so yes, the same thing we can do with, 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 with bacteria. We can, have, we can use whole bacteria, we can use live attenuated bacteria, bacteria we can use inactivated bacteria, we can use um, proteins from the bacteria, we can use toxide instead of the toxin. It looks like the toxin behaves like a toxin, but you respond to this is not exactly the toxin. So, uh, we can use recombinant bacteria as well. Uh, so the whole gamut of vaccines that we've been using passed through from live um, vaccines, starting with, 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 um, with smallpox, which in fact is still given as a, as, as a live vaccination, to if it has to be given to, to a recombinant, um, recombinant protein. Now, what can go wrong? Things can go wrong naturally. You can have hypersensitivity reaction, which can cause cell damage to an excessive immune response to antigens. Sometimes when I get up in the morning, I'm sneezing a lot, I jokingly say to my wife, I'm allergic to the fresh air. It's some pollen that's in the air that's, that's causing problems. I always have to have some antihistamine somewhere in, in the house. Um, so you can have hypersensitivity to infectious uh, agents, um, what we just refer to as allergic, allergic response. So you can, for example, pick up a pollen and you make antibodies, as you were saying, to the pollens. The pollens, the antibodies can attach to cells, in this particular case, a cell called mast cell. And the mast cell has the antibodies, and the whole idea is for, on the normal conditions, for the bad guy, the antigen, to attach to the antibodies, and we deal with the antigen that way, where the antigen is just a protein by itself, or it's part of an infectious process. But the mast cell is a very interesting cell. The mast cell in this situation, releases histamine. And histamine can bring about all sorts of reactions. And that's why I said some people have to have antihistamine. But this is normal. You can have this, nothing to do with vaccine, just as, this is what happens to you, to some people, normally. And this can happen to some vaccines as well. So when it happens to a vaccine, it's not something that's, that's out of the sky. This is something that your body has been doing normally to, 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 other, to, to other agents. Because in fact, there are just so many ways that the body can respond to, to anything, whether it has to be a vaccine or, a, or it's um, something naturally in, infectious. You can also have inflammation in, in, um, in, 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 in giving a, a vaccine. And the inflammation, in fact, is signaled by mast cells, which of course will release some histamine. The histamine, as I said, will do a number of things. One of the things it does is to cause fluid to accumulate 
around the injury. And we have the swelling, and you say, oh, this thing is swollen. Well, the swelling is actually good in, in, in some ways if you want to get into um, some, some quote-unquote na natural medicine because what it does, it dilutes the toxin or dilutes the agent um, that is there. You also have a temperature. The temperature, to some extent, a temperature can be good because there are some organisms, some microbes, that are temperature sen sensitive, and the temperature can actually re um, result in the, in the demise of those microbes. You can have fever. Fever is actually a defense mechanism. We see this naturally when you pick up an infection. So when you have a fever from getting a vaccine, it is not anything new. There are just so many ways the body can respond to, um, to injury, whether the injury is natural or the injury is artificial via um, um, a vaccine. You can also have, naturally, an anaphylactic shock, where a large amount of substances are released. There's a drop in, in blood pressure. All right, and you may actually faint. Nothing to do with vaccines, but it can happen with vaccines. And of course, in such cases, you need epinephrine or adrenaline to bring the, um, to contract the blood vessels to get the pressure, the pressure back up. So the point I'm trying to make about this is that for years, we've been using vaccines of all types in many ways, whether it has to do with a live virus or an attenuated virus or live bacteria, or attenuated bacteria, or some product of that virus or bacteria. What is new today, and what is new since last week, is that for the first time in history, for the first time in history, because of all the work that has gone through the last couple of years, and Dr. Lewis will expand on this, we have been asked to get in our body, the machinery to make the antigen rather than getting the antigen. And this is what the furor and all the concern quite rightly is about. And this is why, as, as the minister said, that we need to talk because there are some concerns, the concerns are genuine, and we have to put everything on the table, including the fact that you can have complications. This is what uh, um, Pfizer has been saying. Complications including injection site pain, tiredness, headache, muscle pain. You can get this when you pick up an infection. A whole host of things. You can get swollen nodes, lymph nodes. You get this when you pick up a, a, an infection. You, so you can get mild versions of this when you're vaccinated. We've seen this with other vaccines even before the messenger RNA, which as I said, Dr. Lewis will talk to, to you some, some, some more about. And it can, it can get bad. There are rare cases. There are rare cases, and it's all a question of balance. We may have difficulty in breathing, swelling over your face and throat. Fries himself, himself mentioned this. But in the overwhelming cases that we've seen so far, in the history of vaccination, the good far, far outweigh the bad. And that, in essence, what it is. It's a question of balance. There's a price to pay for life, and, and, and it's debt, <laughs> fortunately. There's no, we're not immortal, and you have to balance the illness. As, as the CMO said, many of us have not seen other infectious diseases. When you see that, and you hear of deaths and, and, and all the ravages of diseases, and you look at the minor complications, yes, there may be some occasional major ones from vaccine. Where is the balance of the argument? has to be with vaccines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Simon, for giving us that primer on immunology and uh, certainly I think if you again if you're not within the, the profession some of it may be a bit um, much to take in all at once but I think Dr. Simon has pretty much laid out a very complex topic in a, in a, in a way that I think most people will, would understand and certainly we would have more discourse specifically as it relates to new vaccines, new types of vaccines, and how these differ from the vaccines that may utilize either live cells that have been
attenuated or changed. Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to recognize the protocols already established. I would like to say good morning to everyone present and everyone uh, viewing from at home or at work or wherever in the world you are. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for, for having me. Uh, my duty today is to talk to you about updates on the development of COVID-19 vaccines, where we are in terms of bringing uh, these much needed vaccines to the world and what's the latest in terms of what's available to us. Okay? Uh, I want to make a few disclosures. There have been some uh, concerns voiced by the public that all they're hearing from, all, all the people that they're hearing from are either employees of these pharmaceutical companies or their government officials, their persons who are, uh, their, their vested interests are in getting the population to take the vaccine. So first disclosure I'd like to make is that I am not employed by any of the pharmaceutical companies that are, are going to be mentioned in the presentation. I do not work for the government. Antiguan Barbuda, the Ministry of Health, or the Mount St. John's Medical Center. Right? There's nothing wrong with these institutions. I just want you to know that you're getting a private, unbiased opinion this morning. Okay. Uh, also, the information that you're going to be getting is not just my personal opinion. All the references uh, that the information is taken from will be listed as you go through the presentation. Okay? Most of it comes directly from uh, either peer reviewed articles, directly from the World Health Organization, or from directly from the World Health Organization or from PAHO. And you see some, some of them listed here. Okay, so now, uh, talking about the vaccine and uh, to piggyback on my illustrious colleague and former teacher, uh, Dr. Simon, um, vaccines are things that we should all be used to. Unfortunately, sometimes you don't take illnesses very seriously because we've never seen them. We've never heard of them. We've heard about our grandfathers and great grandfathers suffering from it, but it's never been in our sphere before. And that is because of the work done to vaccinate the population against these illnesses, as your uh, chief medical officer would have said earlier. Uh, when a vaccine goes through its development, how it's made, how it's, it comes to you as a consumer. It has to go through stages of what we call trials. So before it even gets to be tested in human beings, it has to go through preclinical trials. It has to be tested in animals, tested in laboratories, and the effects of it have to be noted before its safety can be judged to be tried in humans. Uh, a lot of the concern revolves around this, these particular vaccines that are coming out now because one of the main concerns is how quickly they're being developed. So all the healthcare professionals are so happy that this vaccine can be made so quickly and we can get it to persons, but the general public tends to be a little bit weary and scared of its, its rapidness of development. So I'm here to tell you no steps in the safety of this vaccine have been skipped. That's not how the process works. I will show you in uh, an upcoming slide how the actual time to delivery of the vaccine has been shortened. So you know it's been shortened, but probably you don't know how it's been shortened. None of the safety steps have been skipped, and you will see how that's been done in a second. So usually the vaccine goes to its preclinical trials, it's tested in animals and in laboratories, and then it moves on to phase one, where you get a small group of volunteer persons. These are not people who are kidnapped and sequestered. They volunteer willingly, and they are cared for throughout the entire experience. And these, this small group of persons, they are then exposed to the vaccine and all of the effects 
whether positive or negative, are duly noted and they must be noted. So all of the conspiracy theories that they're just hiding what the vaccine actually does, that's actually not allowed to happen, okay? So the Pan American Health Organization, the World Health Organization, are very diligent, they're very stringent in terms of what they allow the populations to receive, and all the results that are uh, taking place in these trials must be publicly noted and delivered. Uh, in phase two, the vaccine is then given to persons who are at most risk of the illness that you're trying to help to prevent. Okay, so in this particular instance, uh, you've heard the term comorbidities before, the persons who have existing health issues like hypertension, diabetes, asthmatics, and so on and so forth. Uh, the vaccine will be given to those persons to see how it affects them or how it affects their long-standing illnesses. When it is then deemed safe, it is moved on to phase three, which is then given to thousands of people, and usually it's, it's in excess of 30,000 people. And then all of the effects are noted, whether positive or negative, and they are, they are documented. And then, of course, we don't just say, well, we're happy. You know, those 30,000 30, people, they reacted well, so we're ready to just give it to the rest of the world now. It doesn't work that way. We still have another stage, the fourth stage, which is where we actually let the prolonged study of this vaccine continue, even after it's been released to the public. So if uh, 10 years down the line, we notice that quite a significant number of persons are, are developing a particular symptom or they're developing a, developing a particular illness, we then put that, uh, that vaccine or that illness under scrutiny to see if the vaccine that was released is related to it at all in any way. Now, uh, what you're seeing here in this slide, on the top, the traditional development route where each of the trials and each of the different stages of the trials are done consecutively. So one happens directly after the other. You'd complete stage one, then you'd move on to stage two, and so on and so forth. And this is what normally generally takes years. So if you've ever heard that vaccines are usually supposed to take five, eight, ten years to develop, that's what usually takes that long. Okay? What we've done now, because of the extent of this crisis and this pandemic, is some of these trials are done concurrently. They're done in parallel. So you don't shorten the time of the trial, you don't shorten the eff efficacy of the trial, you do not shorten or perturb the results of the trial, but you can run them in parallel and document what's happening. And of course, you don't just run stage four at the same time you're running stage one, you can run stages one and two concurrently, you can run stages two and three concurrently, and so on and so forth. Stage four will always be the prolonged chronic uh, viewing of this, the effects of this vaccine. So as you can see at the top and at the bottom, stage four just goes on at infinitum, at however long it takes for us to be concretely sure that the vaccine is safe. Uh, another reason that this vaccine, or at least the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine has been done so quickly, it's always amazing to me that people are not surprised that we went from a brick cell phone to a portable laptop in your hand, like an iPhone, within 15 to 20 years. And then we can go from that to an iPhone 11 or an iPhone 12 within a year. So the advance in technology when it comes to manipulatable objects doesn't surprise anyone, but the advance in technology when it comes to science and medicine always does. It's, it's weird. But yes, yeah, science is learning from itself. Science is moving forward. And no things that used to take us five, six, seven years don't take that long anymore because we tend to know what we're doing by now, okay? Uh, the mRNA vaccines, one of the beauty, the beauty spots of them, historical vaccines, especially those that are used with live or semi-live vaccines, um, viruses, sorry, pathogens, you would have to actually grow that pathogen in, a, in some medium, whether it's in chicken eggs or in living tissue, you'd have to grow them for quite some time before you had a large enough sample set to then go and administer to your, your trial uh, patients. Now, when you're talking about RNA, you don't need to grow the entire virus. You can simply take a portion of the genetic material of that virus and you can replicate it in a laboratory. And that happens at a much faster speed, a much faster rate than if you had to grow the entire organism over years. So that's another reason why this vaccine was developed as quickly as it was, and it seems like we're rushing to deliver it to the world. Uh, new additions and recent updates, as soon as recent, as December 10th, 
uh, one of the vaccines, particularly one done from the, the Australian University in Queensland, it was abandoned. So everyone is now thinking that we're just rushing to give some people some kind of vaccine so monies can be made and people can get back to work and economies can boom and no one actually cares about the guinea pigs that these vaccines are being given to. This is proof and evidence that that is not the case. That is not how vaccines are created. Vaccines must go through trials and if at any step in any of the trials the vaccine fails, it is abandoned. Okay, one of the reasons why so many trials are happening, in fact, in excess of 500 trials are happening worldwide right now, is because vaccines typically, when they hit clinical trials, don't have a very high success rate. So all the vaccines that you would have heard about today in all the discourse that we're having are the survivors of the trials. You can think of them as the hunger games of vaccines. Okay? These are just the survivors, the ones that made it till the end. Usually only about 20% of all vaccines that make it to clinical trials actually make it to the end. Okay, so this is one example recently of one that was abandoned because it was not deemed to be safe for whatever the reasons found in that study were. Uh, in, on December 11th, the AstraZeneca University of Oxford vaccine, um, that program kind of joined forces with a Russian one, that um, science lab in Gamalia, the Gamalia Institute, and you will see in a later slide as well why they tended to try to team up. There were some benefits that one vaccine was given, but it had another drawback, whereas that other vaccine did not have the drawback, but it did not have all the benefits of the other. So they kind of tried to team up to see if they could borrow each other's strengths. That is something that also happens during clinical trials. It happens all the time. Um, and on December 12th, the Genova Biopharmaceuticals and HDT Bio entered phases one and two. Now, it's important to note that uh, a vaccine that is now made it to trial three doesn't necessarily have to be the best vaccine in the world. The best vaccine in the world may only still be in phase one. But because it hasn't gotten to three yet, it may not be as popular or as well known. The only way for us to know if it's better than the one that's already in three is for it to get to three and for us to see its results. So this will be an ongoing thing. We're all hoping that by the beginning of next year, we'll have a viable vaccine for the public, but it may not be the best end-all, be-all of vaccines. You may see an even better one by maybe this time next year. Uh, here you're seeing a slide of the coronavirus tracker. This was published by Zimmer, Corum, and We, and it is published in the New York Times. So if you ever wanted to go and read the report yourself, please feel free to do so. It is easily accessible on Google. Uh, it currently shows the 58 vaccines currently in clinical trials. So these are past the preclinical phase and are now in testings with human beings. So these are the 58. Uh, and it even lists the one that we have previously mentioned that was abandoned. Uh, if you look at the side, you can also see that in phase three, which is the one where you're actually testing it amongst tens of thousands of people, we have 15 current vaccines, of which, of course, the Pfizer BioNTech would be one of them. Uh, the leading vaccines, uh, the popular ones, you have the Fio, Pfizer BioNTech. Uh, I will piggyback on Dr. Simon's presentation and go a little deeper into what kind of vaccines these are and why it is that it's important for you to know that. Um, you have the Moderna vaccine, those two, the Pfizer and Moderna, those two are the new RNA or the nucleotide type vaccines. These are the ones that are causing all the row. Uh, you have the CanSino and the Gamelia type, which is now being partnered with the, Os the Oxford AstraZeneca. Johnson & Johnson has thrown their hat into the ring as well. You have the Novavax, the Vector Institute, and the Sinovac vaccines as well. So all of these would have achieved a um, higher end of the clinical trials, whether the end of stage two or actually made it to stage three. And yes. Why so many trials? Because of what we spoke about before. Of course, we want to make sure that we get the public a, a usable number and a usable quality of vaccine as soon as possible, but not before it, of course, would be safe. So what you do is you test as many different methodologies, as many different labs, as many different resources as you can to make as many trial uh, vaccines as you possibly can in the hope of getting to the ones that would be most effective, most safe, uh, most economically viable for, for the persons most at risk. 
That way, if only 20% of them make it, then you're looking at a very large number of vaccines still being available to the general public. If only 20% of 500 make it, you're still looking at 100 vaccines. Fair enough? Okay. Uh, how does the WHO help to ensure that all these vaccines are properly evaluated? So they establish robust and transparent processes. Uh, a lot of mysticism exists around the creation of vaccines. But this only happens because of the current day and age that we live in, the age of social media, where we don't get news from CNN and BBC anymore. We get it from the Shade Room and from uh, Bleacher Report and from all these different social media outlets now. Uh, you can't peer review them. You can't check references. You cannot see the validity of who's actually presenting the information to you. But we soak it up anyway. Okay? Drama sells more than truth. So, uh, the WHO does not tend to do that. The WHO and PAHO, they tend to actually go through quite diligent, stringent processes. And please note as well that this does not mean, let's say, let's take an example, Pfizer or BioNTech, they, their vaccine is at the forefront, it's the one that has gotten uh, the most media traction. Let's say for whatever reason, WHO does their studies and they feel as though, well, mm, we like your studies, we like what you're saying, but for some reason it doesn't meet our criteria and we don't think we want to use it in our populations, then they won't. Then they won't, all right? They are not prone to being strong-armed. They do not have to listen to any uh, private institutions. They have the people's interest at heart, and if they say they don't think it's safe, then they won't allow you to, to, to have it in your, your forum. So the public should feel a bit safer knowing that whatever vaccine the, the government of Matinga Barbuda decides to bring should be WHO approved, and if it is, then it would have gone through quite a bit of stringent um, uh, protocols. So please fear it a bit less if it does do so. They convene very large panels of experts. Just today, just as today, we are all trying to give you, the public, the best information possible. They are even greater heads than ours, even bigger heads than ours, and much more uh, brains than ours at work doing the exact same thing. So please ensure that it's not one big money-making scheme. We're actually trying to do the best we can for the general public. Uh, they also work along with partners, uh, and it, it is one big collaboration in an effort to help to bring this pandemic to an end. Uh, as Dr. Simon would have mentioned, there are different types of immunogens, meaning different types of content for the vaccines that we use to actually provide you with the protection that you need. Some people are saying they don't want anything unnatural in their bodies. Please understand that vaccines are not unnatural things that they put into you. What they do, they take natural proteins or they take a natural whole virus that they attenuate or they half kill it. So it's not strong enough to cause the illness in you. It's only present so that your body can learn to recognize it. Think of it as instead of us injecting you with uh, a serial mass murderer, what we do is we inject you with a warning poster of the serial mass murderer. So your defense. and your army and your military get to recognize this, this murderer, and if he ever does pass your doorstep, you say, hi, good morning, and you shoot him in his face. Okay? That is all that a vaccine does. It doesn't necessarily uh, give you the illness. Now, as Dr. Semmel would have suggested, or would have uh, mentioned earlier, sorry, sometimes uh, when your body is ramping up its efforts to get ready for, for an illness, it can simulate the signs and symptoms that you would have gotten if you had gotten the illness. So it's a very common occurrence for people to say, Doc, I took the flu shot, and then I got a flu. And you say, okay, no problem. What were your symptoms? Oh, my temperature came up a little bit. I was a bit fatigued or tired, and I did feel some muscle cramping. And you say, okay, good. So congratulations. You've had an immune response. Your immune system has accepted the warning poster, and you are now ready to fight a flu should it ever try and get into your body. And they say, wait, that, that was a good thing? You say, yes, it's a good thing. Okay, you having that response meant that your immune system did recognize the vaccine and you are now protected. Okay, so you didn't actually get the flu, you just had an immune response. Good. Uh, the big question, how much do these things cost? Or what do they cost us, the public or the economy? Uh, I will say that the government has done a very good job through its partners with the, the Pan American Health Organization, with COVAX, to try and ensure 
that the vaccine will not cost you, the people, out of your direct pocket anything. However, it does have a cost, and that cost will usually be about to the tune of the, the Pfizer BioNTech. Uh, it's about 20 US per dose, uh, where the Moderna one is projected to be probably around 32 to 37 dollars uh, US per dose. And of course, these costs are not going to be borne directly by you, the population. Uh, in terms of why we want you to get the vaccine, you've heard of, heard of us speaking of uh, herd immunity, what is herd immunity, and all herd immunity really is. Uh, think of a lion trying to attack some buffaloes, okay? Now, you would be the baby buffalo in the middle. That's easy for the lion to kill, and the lion is just gunning for you. So what does the herd do? The herd surrounds you, and they face the lions with horns pointing outwards. So the lion cannot pass the horns to get through that line of buffalo to get to you, the baby buffalo. That's essentially how the society protects each and every one of us. We protect each other. We take care of each other. What happens is that the coronavirus will come. It will meet a line of defense of people who have been inoculated against it. And it will not be able to infect them or pass them to infect other people. So if you are now in the, the community and you are not protected, you are not inoculated, you still get some defense from all of your, your comrades around you. Uh, this type of immunity or this type of protection varies from virus to virus. So they will tell you things like the, the measles virus, the, the, uh, it has a very high herd immunity percentage. You'd have to have about 97 or 95 percent of your population uh, vaccinated before you get that immunity. And I think because Antigua Mabuda has that, which is why we were able to escape that imported case that the CMO would have mentioned earlier. For the coronavirus, the, the estimated projections are lower, much lower. So we only have to get about 70% or so of our population uh, inoculated to get the herd immunity. But of course, for a population of 100,000, you're looking at about 70,000 persons. So the more of us that decide not to get the vaccine out of fear or misinformation is the less protection the, the society actually has and the more at risk our loved ones become. Uh, it is projected by COVAX that throughout the world, worldwide, without this vaccine, our economies will continue to suffer losses at approximately 375 billion US dollars per month. Okay? So this, this virus does have quite the impact worldwide, and this is why all of the resources are being dedicated to trying to fight it. So if you thought it was just uh, money making, it's more na nation and world saving that we're trying to do. Okay, good, so we go back to types of vaccines and I won't stay long on this topic because uh, my colleague, Dr. Sam, did a very good job at explaining these earlier. Uh, there are four main groups that I'm going to go through with you. That's because they have to do with the types of vaccines we're going to talk about in a second. The four main types are you can have a vaccine where they actually use a whole virus. They take the whole virus, they don't break it up, they don't destroy it, but they attenuate it, they half kill it so it doesn't hit you with its full force. And then that whole virus is then injected into you so your body can recognize it, learn to fight it in a safer manner, and then you can build up your protection to it. Uh, other types of vaccines, what they do is they don't use the whole virus, they just break off pieces of proteins that usually exist on the surface. For instance, the coronavirus that we're fighting right now, uh, it's called the coronavirus, to, to go back to the Latin and the Spanish again. Uh, corona means a crown. So what the coronavirus does, it has bunches of little crowns all on its surface, like it's going to the prom, it has nice little tiaras all over it. And what we do is we break off the tiaras and we inject those into the body and the body learns to recognize the tiaras. So what the body do then says is, anything that comes into me that has on a crown, I'm going to kill it. Right? Whether it's coronavirus or not, once it has this protein, it's dead. And that's how we make that, those types of vaccines. Uh, then we have viral vector vaccines. This is new technology, well, not so new, but in the realm of vaccines, it's newer, where what we do is we take another virus, a much more harmless virus, something that wouldn't necessarily cause you any illness, but it does exist in, in nature, and we take that vaccine and we inject it with particles of the virus that we actually want to fight. So what we do is we take a lesson from nature. You know what we call vectors in nature. You have rats that can carry leptospirosis, you have mosquitoes that can carry dengue fever. We take a lesson from nature and we say, well, tell you what, we're going to use a, a virus and make it a vector for another virus. And we use a harmless one and we inject it with the material for a much more dangerous one. But 
we stop that virus from replicating or from making itself into the dangerous virus. So that way, when we inject it into you, uh, the patient, it doesn't cause you any illness. It doesn't cause you any harm. But your body still gets to recognize it and still learns how to fight the more dangerous virus. And then, of course, the new kid on the block, uh, the, the genetic type vaccines, the nucleic acid vaccines, where what they do is they actually take the genetic components, what makes up the virus, what makes the virus itself. And then they use that genetic material to tell our bodies how to create the protein that that virus would use to get into us ourselves. So we actually take away all of the weaponry that the virus would have, and we learn to make its weapons ourselves, learn to recognize the weapons, learn to protect ourselves from the weapons, so by the time the vaccine comes along, it can't do us anything. So essentially, think of the virus as carrying uh, an M16 machine gun. We go, we steal the gun, we learn the bullet's trajectory, we create bulletproof vests, so by the time the virus comes with its bullets, they can't do us a thing. Okay? So that, that's how we're using it. Uh, now, to talk about the actual vaccines on the market, the ones that you would have heard about and probably some that you would not have, you have the Pfizer, BioNTech vaccines. These all fall on this new type of vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, the genetic ones. So it has been shown through its clinical studies so far to have an efficacy of about 95%, which means everyone who gets vaccinated against this, this virus, about 95% of these persons when actually faced with a real coronavirus uh, infection will not develop any serious signs and symptoms of the disease and will have no fear of actually dying from it. And the other 5% doesn't necessarily mean that they will die. It just means that they may develop some of the more serious symptoms like shakes, aches and pains, or difficulty breathing. Uh, you have the Moderna vaccine, which shows a slightly lower uh, uh, efficacy at 94.5%. Uh, both vaccines are given via muscular injections. There's another one from a group called Angus. Angus now is using a vaccine which they're trying to inject only to the skin, not to the muscles. Uh, it's still given as a multi-dose. All three of these vaccines are given as multi-doses with several weeks in between each other. And that goes towards what Dr. Sam would have spoke about earlier in terms of giving your body that initial facing of the antigen. You build up some of your antibodies, but then they fall off. So then you give a second dose after about three weeks, and then you get this secondary, much bigger, much stronger uh, reaction, and your antibodies are now at full force and ready to keep you protected. Uh, in terms of the viral vector vaccines, this is what the Oxford Astra AstraZeneca uh, vaccine is. is, is. It's, it's essentially a viral vector. They use a much more uh, harmless virus, an adenovirus, and then they put some of the gene genetic material of the coronavirus into it and allow you to, to fight it off. Uh, there is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and there is the Gamelia group, which is that one at the bottom right in, in Russian. And then you have a CanSino bio vaccine. Now, in terms of that discussion of why would Gamelia and AstraZeneca um, join forces, if you look at the storage for the AstraZeneca, it's stable in a refrigerator for six months. It doesn't have to be kept at those sub-zero temperatures in deep freezers and be transported at those temperatures um, like the BioNTech uh, vaccine would need to be, whereas the Gamelia groups does. It has to be transported in a freezer and kept at those very low temperatures. So hopefully they're thinking that by partnering up, uh, they can get some of that technology from, from their partners where it's easier to transport, easier to keep, which will, which will of course, bring down the cost of the vaccine. Uh, you'll also notice that the, the Gamelia group, the time between the two doses is shorter than the one for the AstraZeneca. So you can get the same effect of building up your immune system to that high ramped up state of alert without waiting as long to, to get your second dose. Um, you'll also notice that the Gamelia group's efficacy is a bit higher. Now, you may say 92% is not that much higher than 90%, but in terms of um, efficacy on a, a scale of millions of people, that 2% is a lot of people. Okay, so what they're trying to do is they're trying to partner up to see if they can grab each other's benefits and mold them into one. Now, in terms of protein-based vaccines, where you just take a sample of the, the crown, the tiara, you have the Novavax vaccines, the Medicago, uh, vaccine and one produced by the Institute of Medical Biology, that's out of um, the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences. Uh, what you notice about these, though, is that although they've made it to stage three, 
they cannot publish or they have not published how, actual, how actually uh, efficient they are. The efficacy numbers are still unknown. So in terms of them coming to the public, you will not be hearing about those coming to the public uh, as soon as probably the Pfizer or the Moderna ones would be because you need to have established workable results before they're made public. So if you ever had any doubt about how soon these things are being rushed to you, understand that they are in fact going through all the processes that they need to go through and if they do not pass them, they do not become available to you. As of the 14th, which is today, as of the 14th of December, there's still only one FDA approved for emergency use vaccine. Of all the 58 that are in trials, only one has been given actual approval and that is the one from Pfizer and BioNTech. Uh, you have here some examples, um, one from India, um, two from China, of the inactivated or attenuated virus vaccine. So these are the vaccines that are tried and true. We know or the method is tried and true. We've been doing vaccines like this for a long time. We take the virus, we half kill it, and then we, we introduce it into the host so that you can learn to fight it off. Uh, this is the one that people are most afraid about because you're actually injecting the patient with the actual pathogen that they're afraid of. And of course, lack of knowledge always breeds fear. So please be educated that these viruses cannot give you the illness. They cannot hurt you. They have to go through very, very strict protocols to be proven to be safe before they can be used, even in a laboratory, much earlier than when they actually get given to you. Okay, so these are the vaccines that are available to us on the market as of now, and hopefully within the near future, we'll be seeing many more, and we'll be seeing all the efficacy rates of all the ones mentioned. Thank you very much. Please. So one more time, please. What types of viruses? There's differences between the type of virus. Uh huh. The COVID-19 virus. Uh huh. And the COVID virus. Sure, sure, no problem. So that is an, an error in terminology. I will say that much. The virus that we're actually fighting is called the SARS-CoV-2 virus. That's what we're fighting. The illness that it produces is what we call COVID-19. So there's not a COVID-19 virus. The COVID-19 is just the illness, the disease. So there's no difference between the coronavirus or the, the COVID-19 virus. It's, it's one and the same. Although I will clarify and say that coronaviruses are a family of, of viruses. It's not one type of virus. Okay. So what happens now is this is a new one one that we've never seen before, which is why it's called a novel coronavirus, meaning a new coronavirus. And of the new coronaviruses, it's still not the first one we've seen, it's the 19th. And it came out on 2019, what a coincidence, how lovely. So th that's the difference between coronavirus, COVID virus, and um, I'm not sure that there's one called the China virus. That is just like a media projected name because of course the virus would have originated out of China. But they, they, all three terms are talking about the exact same thing. Good. Thank you very much, Dr. Lewis, for your enlightening presentation. And certainly, I think the questions have started, and we do have a section later on in the agenda to, de to field more questions. So certainly, we will go through the other two panelists before we get into the, the presentation, the, the exchange of questions and answers. So. At this juncture, the break has indicated the break has as indicated in your agenda. We will move past that 
and we will turn over to our colleagues from the Pan American Health Organization to give their presentations, and certainly in the interest of time for us to, to move along. So first up, we have Dr. Felipe Molina Leon, uh, PAHO International Consultant for Vaccine Safety. And uh, the, as you see on the agenda, working towards equitable access to safe COVID-19 vaccines. And that will be our next presenter uh, remotely. So I will turn over to, to Dr. Leon. Yes, uh, we'll just have to, to let the, the entire room hear you. So if you give us one moment, please. Try to show your screen. One second. One second. Could you try talking? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, excuse, excuse me. me. I, am, I, am, I am hearing myself. Hello, hello. Hello. Hello, yeah. Can you hear me now? We can hear you clearly. Could you hear us? Yes, yes. Uh, the the background noise it's 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 not there anymore. All right. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, everyone. And thank I I thank all the authorities that are present and all the people that is hearing this and is seeing this event. And we really appreciate uh, the Ministry of Health and Wellness and Environment of Antigua and Barbuda for inviting us to talk about the way and the work that PAHO is being done, uh, is being doing uh, to the safe introduction of the COVID-19 vaccines. So my name is Felipe Molina, I'm medical doctor and um, international consultant for vaccine safety, working at the immunization unit. So the outline of my presentation will be uh, showing you first the vaccine safety model then the, uh, a little bit of the background of vaccine safety monitoring the Americas. And uh, at the end, we will see the project for the regional SAVI surveillance or AFI surveillance system. What are the goals and objectives? So the background of vaccine safety monitoring the Americas. And uh, at the end, we will see the project for the regional SAVI surveillance or AFI surveillance system. What are the goals and objectives? So the first thing, thing we need to uh, uh, talk about or speak about is why we should speak about safety in, in with related to vaccines. 
So we speak about safety because we understand that any health intervention in any health intervention entails a probability of producing a secondary effect other than the good expected main result. So although we also when we intervene, we try we try to do our best. No intervention is 100% effective, neither 100 100% safe. This happened for all interventions from medicines to surgeries and vaccines are not the exception to that. So even with food, you need to be aware that it could happen that you can get an allergy to any kind of food and that you can have an, an adverse event related to uh, a type of food that you are exposed to. So the point here is that we need to consider that with any intervention, in any health intervention, we have risk related to it. And what we are trying to do is to find out what the, what's the amount of that risk, what are also the benefits. We try to measure the benefits and try to do a balance, to balance, to take decisions. So the important thing is how we how we approach to do that balance and what's the information we have to do that in, a, in an adequate manner. So around all the, all the elements of that guarantees vaccines, guarantee the safety of vaccines, you need to be aware that at the, at the region, at the American region, we have developed a vaccine safety model that it's led by an interinstitutional work, meaning that uh, there's a lot of institutions working together to guarantee and to assure that the vaccines are safe for all the people. Those components uh, goes from a, a safe and effective development of vaccines, uh, passing through the uh, safe storage and distribution by guarantee the call change and all the uh, change of a uh, distribution, distribution of stakeholders, then to a uh, safe manipulation of handling of vaccines by developing say a, a vaccination strategies that guarantees that the personnel using the vaccines are really well trained and supervised and have the capacity to do a safe vaccination. We also have AFI or adverse events following immunization surveillance systems. All countries in the region have a kind and, and forms of different uh, AFI surveillance systems that collect information on the adverse events that are occurring anytime a person is vaccinated. And that leads to the detection of any problem with the quantity of related to the vaccine itself. And we also have a component related to the risk communication plan. This event, for example, it's related to the communication on the risk to vaccines. We cannot say, and we need to be honest and transparent with the population and with ourselves and tell to everyone what are the potential real risks related to vaccines. and also speak about the real benefits of vaccines. So in that way, people will take decision based on, on right information. So I'm gonna show you a little bit this. You have already, you have already seen this. This is the vaccine development process and it have, have been really well explained by the previous speakers. So I'm not going, I'm not going to go into more detail here you see the uh, phases that we develop when we test a vaccine in humans. There are three phases, phase one, two, and three. And the uh, differences between those stages uh, depends on the number of subjects that are exposed to them. It's a stepwise approach that guarantees the safety of the, of the subjects that are included in those trials. And added to what has been previously mentioned by the former speakers, there are a lot of documents and requirements that are included in the clinical trials that the sponsors of the clinical trials and the research centers should meet in order to be able to be approved 
to run any or to develop any clinical trial. So it's not that we must uh, trust without blindly the researchers that are, that are doing research. All national regulatory authorities uh, guarantee that uh, they meet all the requirements that are in the law that uh, are uh, required as uh, safety checks uh, when the trial is running. So there are a lot of procedures and requirements that the regulations uh, ask the investigators and the sponsors in order to develop a trial and to include subjects in that trial. So regarding COVID-19 vaccines, this graph depicts some of the characteristics of the development process. What we need to see here, and that has been mentioned by the previous speaker, is that at the moment of the use of the vaccine, the clinical research process assessment will be finished. The basic efficacy and safety data will be available and ongoing clinical trial trials will continue after two years of the authorization in order to guarantee that the whole safety of the vaccine is being tested. So the speed of the process is ensured due to shortcuts, not in the safety or efficacy evaluation or assessment, but in the administrative procedures mainly. And thanks to the fact that many processes are done in parallel and not in a sequential manner as for the other vaccines. So here you see some additional uh, specificities related to COVID-19 vaccines. For COVID-19 vaccines development, uh, it has been mobilized more resources simultaneously. Whereas for standard vaccines, what you see here is that uh, the kind and the amount of investment is being done in a progressive manner. So since you have a lot of resources before uh, for the development of the vaccine, put at the same time, you have a lot more, much more uh, means to guarantee that uh, the, the process will be faster than the usual vaccines. That has also to do with what companies are doing. For standard vaccines, usually when uh, you have the approval, uh, the approval of the vaccine, they start to increase the production of the vaccine and the investment they do on the production of the vaccine. While for these new COVID-19 vaccines, com companies are expanding the manufacturing and production capacity before the approval in order to ensure efficient vaccine development deployment and to guarantee not only the access to the vaccine, but to the quality of the uh, manufacturing process. So, at the end, what we expect from all these testing and evaluation and assessment process, process is that we have a good vaccine. A good vaccine need to, need to uh, accomplish some requirements to meet some, re some uh, characteristics. Here you have a list of those characteristics that should be vaccines that effectively prevent or reduces the severity of the infections of the disease, of the infectious disease, provides durable and long-term protection, achieves immunity with minimal number of doses, provides maximum number of antigens that confer broadest protection against infection, causes no or mild adverse reactions, is stable at streams of storage conditions over a prolonged period of time and is available for general use through mass production. So known, although we are gonna have some, uh, some uh, gaps in knowledge on these new vaccines and that is true. For example, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have uh, the knowledge about the long-term effects of some of those vaccines. And we will have and we'll, we'll have most of this information and we will know if the vaccines uh, meet most of these characteristics. What we have in place in order to know if the vaccines that are being used in the population are safe, it's a, a whole and comprehensive AFI and or ESAVI 
Savitz, the term derived from the Spanish version of the EFI uh, use uh, of the term of, for adverse events related to vaccination. We have a complex system that's running behind the, the use of the vaccine that detects, that it, it's able to detect uh, the, any adverse events related to a vaccine to investigate and to do a thorough analysis of those events to know if exactly if that those events were actually related to the vaccine or were rela were related to any other any other disease that the patient had or any other factor factor not related to the vaccine. Added to that system, we have. Uh, global institutions and, and committees that provide recommendations on the safety of the vaccines and assess any signal that has that is detected when the vaccines are used. These uh, global perspective and institutions guarantee that all the vaccines that are being used in the population and any uh, event that is detected can, could not cause any additional harm uh, to other populations. One of those committees well recognized at the global level is the GACS, the Global Advisory Committee uh, for Vaccine Safety, which was established in 1999. And that committee developed general recommendations worldwide to guarantee that the use of the vaccines is safe and that no uh, additional events as the, other than the events observed already in clinical trials trials are occurring in, in in relation to the use of any of the vaccines this GACS committee has been uh, given and during this week this week they they will publish the first global manual on the vaccine safety monitoring for these new COVID-19 vaccines that will give recommendations to all countries all over the world to implement safety monitoring uh, systems to guarantee that these new vaccines are really well observed and we detect any problem with them uh, on time. PAHO it has coordinated a strategic response. There's a task force at the headquarters, along with uh, many of the uh, regional committees participating and trying to develop specific regional uh, recommendations to the introduction of COVID-19 that include many, have developed many documents, but include also recommendations on regional and national AFI surveillance system or a SAVI surveillance system that help will help countries not to will help countries how uh, uh, to implement uh, systems that monitor adequately the safety of these new vaccines I'm sorry so in the uh, regional introduction plan readiness self assessment tool checklist, PAHO has focused and have given has given recommendations on the regulatory aspects related to the introduction of these new vaccines, to the surveillance and monitoring and to the safety and surveillance in order to guarantee that the countries uh, adequately implement me measures to monitor the safety of the vaccines. So how is that being done? Uh, the safety in the in the region there are a lot of institutions that um, are in charge of monitoring the safety the situation and the landscape in the region is very diverse with national regulatory authorities in some countries in 26 countries uh, being in charge or participating in the monitoring of the safety immunization programs have also a role and in some countries and in, in 40, 45 countries, uh, these activities related to the safety monitoring of the vaccines is being done by the immunization program jointly with the uh, regulatory, national regulatory authority. So we, uh, since a long time ago, by the GRF report, which is a report that all countries send to PAHO annually, 
we monitor the uh, behavior of, of all ESAVIs or adverse events related to vaccines. And we, uh, and WHO has proposed uh, an indicator that tells us if the safe is the monitoring safety system is working properly. This is the total AFI reports per 100 per thousand surviving infants uh, indicator. And if a country uh, reports more than 10 AFIs, means that the country is, uh, the country system is working properly, is, work, is detecting, is giving signals properly. So Antigua and Barbuda is over that indicator the indicator for 2019 for Antigua and Barbuda reaches the 68.5 AFIs per 100,000 surviving infants. So that tells us that the AFIs or SAVIs are being detected in the country and we need to more, we need to look more closely and sure we need to uh, improve our efforts when these new vaccines arrive. PAHO is also, has also developed a regional manual that it's about to publish on how to improve the SAVI surveillance information system, how countries could implement more strategies to guarantee that uh, this surveillance system work properly and that they are detecting in a timely manner any problem related to a vaccine. So the, one of the projects that we are implementing is the uh, SAVI surveillance regional system that has a goal to uh, ha achieve a sensitive, timely, standardized, reliable and integrated regional surveillance system to contribute to early detection and classification of serious SAVIs and signals on serious adverse events and signals with, with some specific objectives related to uh, the detection and analysis of any kind of uh, event related to a vaccine and to coordinate an adequate response for any uh, event that could be observed. We have assembled five working groups that are developing recommendations to con for countries to improve and strengthen their regulatory mechanisms to develop a standard operating procedures for the regional system, for the regional surveillance system, to strengthen national capacities in SAVI surveillance in the COVID-19 context, and to define model of active surveillance system, as well as establishing re a regional committee for vaccine safety. This committee is intended to evaluate the results of the monitoring of these new vaccines when they, they arrive and to make recommendations on country. And we have developed, developed an information system model where which we expect that Antigua and Barbuda participates to transfer information from the national level to the regional level in order to be able to monitor in real time any signal or any event that uh, any problem that could be detected related to those vaccines. So what, what I wanted to show you and the purpose of this uh, these, um, presentation is to show you that we are preparing and we are uh, making all the efforts to monitor the safety of these new vaccines. That it's, uh, there's a lot of institutions involved in that. There's a lot of documents and recommendations given to countries for the introduction of these new vaccines and to guarantee the safety of, for all the population, the safety use, the safe use for all the population. Thank you very much. And that's my uh, email. And if you have additional questions, we can uh, answer them at the adequate the time. Thank you very much. Dr. Leon, and uh, we will move to the next presenter.
which is Dr. John Fitzsimmons, PAHO's, and to, to give us a presentation on PAHO's revolving fund. Thank you, Chair. Uh, may I share my screen, please? Yes, we're doing that at the moment. As Dr. Molina mentioned, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for this opportunity to share information on behalf of PAHO WHO and its support to Andiga, Barbuda, and other member states in the Caribbean and throughout uh, the region. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be with you uh, and colleagues at the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and, and Environment, uh, the government of Antigua and Barbuda, on this first public consultation, and the, and the topic that I will have been asked to present on is identified as working towards equitable access of safe and effective COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Uh, a brief outline of the presentation includes an overview of the COVAX facility itself. This is a global facility established in collaboration with WHO, Gabi, and CEPI, among other international partners, uh, to review the participation milestones and timeline that PAHO has been actively engaged with uh, since the first quarter of this year. Uh, to outline our engagement uh, with the Caribbean in particular as it relates to the COVAX facility and to touch on country readiness for COVID-19 vaccine introduction. The facility itself uh, is leveraging um, the purchasing power of pooling of demand from a uh, demand for this vaccine from across, across the globe. Uh, uh, and it's composed of two distinct groups of countries, those that are considered self-financing countries, among them Antigua and Barbuda. And there are approximately 95 countries that are considered fi uh, self-financing. And then the second group are the advanced market commitment countries those are uh, approximately 92 countries, uh, 10 of which are in uh, the Americas, and they include six from within the Caribbean region. Uh, and these 10 countries uh, <clears throat> within the Caribbean, uh, sorry, six within the Caribbean and 10 in the region uh, in general would benefit from uh, <clears throat> the subsidization uh, subsidized pricing of the vaccine and, and other support. Um, this uh, diverse portfolio, as was mentioned earlier, crosses various technologies for different platforms, is intended uh, to uh, enter into uh, deals and engagements with uh, vaccine suppliers or a candidate products from around the globe, i.e. different geographies, as was mentioned by previous speakers in terms of the candidate vaccines that have been moving through the various crit, uh, clinical trials. And finally, characteristics, i.e. dose schedules, one versus two doses, the majority of, of uh, the candidate vaccines. Our, the target for the global facility is to deliver 2 billion doses of vaccine to these two groupings of countries during the course of 2021 and through the leadership and guidance of WHO guarantee fair and equitable access to these new vaccines. One of the challenges and one of the lessons learned 
from the H1N1 pandemic in 2009 was uh, the inequitable access. So uh, this time around uh, with uh, the COVID pandemic and the new vaccines, first, we're seeing for the first time production of a new vaccine at record speed while, while not neglecting safety and other important issues, the quality of the vaccine, but also in an effort to ensure that developing countries, such as the majority of our, the countries in this region, receive uh, vaccine uh, <clears throat> as soon as possible uh, as we enter into the new year. Uh, currently, there are nine to 15 vaccine candidates that are being considered within the basket uh, of the COVAX facility portfolio across these four technology uh, platforms. And more may be considered as we progress through uh, 2021. Uh, these candidates are assessed, assessed on several dimensions, safety, efficacy, availability of supply, and PAHO member states such as Antigua and Barbuda can access the COVAX facility portfolio through the PAHO revolving fund. It, along with uh, the UNICEF supply division, are the two main procurement agents for the facility. Uh, UNICEF will be supporting the AMC eligible countries, the other 82 uh, countries in the other regions of the world, uh, from India uh, to Indonesia, <clears throat> uh, to Thailand and, and others uh, in, in, in Africa, et cetera. Key milestones to the COVAX facility are shown here. Uh, this has been an active engagement, as I mentioned, since quarter one and so um, uh, of this year. So in this slide, we'll just be looking at uh, the last quarter of this year into the first quarter of next year. So we'll give you a six, uh, a six month snapshot. Uh, <clears throat> back in September, uh, PAHO Directing Council, which includes all of the <clears throat> ministers of health from the region, including the Minister of Health from Antigua and Barbuda, uh, passed uh, the resolution that is mentioned here for asking uh, the PAHO director Dr. Carissa Etienne to support member states in engaging in global initiatives such as the access to the COVID-19 tool accelerator. And as part of that process, countries uh, among them Antigua and Barbuda signed commitment agreements. These are the 27 self-financing countries executed on those agreements uh, in, the latter, in the latter part of October, uh, while at the same time there were briefings for the advanced market commitment uh, countries beginning later October. And then in the middle of last month on the 12th of December of November, UNICEF and PAHO Revolving Fund issued a joint tender and organized pre-bid conferences with the vaccine suppliers, uh, many of which were mentioned in the previous uh, presentations. Uh, our, the, the arrangement around our international bidding process is uh, in, in waves, three waves. We've received offers already as of the 25th of November a second round from suppliers on the 9th of December, and a third round are, sch are scheduled later this month uh, on the 23rd of November. What will we do with these um, offers? We'll begin to evaluate them uh, based on information that's being provided by the suppliers on the robustness of their uh, safety and quality plan 
um, in terms of presenting their dossiers, for instance, to WHO for pre-qualification processes or to the corresponding national regulatory authorities uh, <clears throat> for their emergency use authorization, among other factors. We'll also look at the uh, availability, uh, the months that, uh, or month or date uh, in which these respective offers and in, uh, intend to have vaccine available, quantities and price among other factors. This will be an active engagement. Uh, it's ongoing now with the offers that have been received and, and following the 23rd of December round, uh, there, <clears throat> there will be further engagement between UNICEF and PAHO uh, <clears throat> with a view towards eventually issuing what are known as long-term arrangements here in this bottom uh, right box uh, to vaccine suppliers. Uh, this is key because <clears throat> then suppliers uh, can uh, move forward in locking up uh, doses for supply to this region and, uh, and, and to other regions uh, through, through UNICEF. In addition, um, we'll, we continue to work actively with WHO on the global allocation mechanism and as mentioned by Dr. Molina uh, previously in supporting countries in terms of their planning and readiness to, um, to receive vaccine. Now, <clears throat> we're, we're looking at a very limited market going into uh, 2021. Uh, and so these, re these readiness plans, uh, <clears throat> the slide that Dr. Mol Molina presented with the various uh, factors shown it is very important uh, uh, on uh, <clears throat> consideration uh, for all ministries uh, in terms of, of <clears throat> uh, being uh, in a position to benefit early on from vaccine when it becomes available. In addition, as part of that process, if we look in the top right corner, uh, the box that's shown there, we're developing a online vaccine demand planning platform, which we'll be sharing uh, with countries uh, next early next month to help with uh, the <clears throat> uh, linking of the at-risk populations that are being defined in national plans to the WHO global allocation mechanism. And we're also currently working through our PAHO country offices uh, in a strategic way uh, to consider the advanced purchasing of syringes that will be needed uh, in larger quantities that, than what are currently being purchased uh, by member states for the routine immunization uh, programs. And this is needed to ensure that syringes are in place uh, in advance of when vaccine is eventually shipped uh, to countries. Uh, this, this slide <coughs> provides an overview of our ongoing support uh, to member states and territories. I mentioned the 27 self-financing countries and you have a perspective here on the nature of their agreements. 19 countries uh, had, have committed purchase arrangements. Eight countries in the region have optional purchase arrangements. You'll notice uh, the, the positioning of our member states within the global community and so far as projected procurement volume ratios. 33% for our 27 countries, Team Europe, 17%, and other self-financing countries 
approximately 50%. And then moving to the left in green, you have the AMC eligible countries, the 10 member states that will benefit from financial support uh, from Gavi. In the region of the Caribbean, we have Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, Haiti, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. Overall, uh, these 10 PAHO member states represent uh, <clears throat> approximately 1.5% of the total procurement volume ratio globally compared with the other AMC eligible countries, many of which are fairly large when you consider Indonesia, India, etc. Uh, so that gives you a view of the global dynamic. And uh, uh, the revolving fund um, uh, is, <clears throat> this is the first time as a region that we're participating in a global facility, in a global mechanism, uh, and sharing our uh, unique principles uh, with uh, the global community in, in an integrated way. On the left, you have our, the components of our technical cooperation package, uh, some of which was mentioned by Dr. Molina already in terms of vaccine safety. And, and um, <clears throat> in addition, we're, con we're concerned with troubleshooting vaccine supply disruptions, such as uh, what occurred at the beginning of the pandemic during the first quarter of this year our regional immunization program has been convening technical advisory group meetings. Um, this is known as our TAG. Uh, and uh, this, this provides the guidance uh, to uh, within the organization and also to member states in terms of uh, moving, ensuring that, <clears throat> that we address uh, appropriate challenges that come in, uh, come up for the routine immunization program as, as we're confronting the introduction of the new vaccine uh, into the coming year. And uh, on Wednesday of this week, uh, there'll be another such tag meeting scheduled, which will also include the NITAGs. And in the case of the Caribbean, the Caribbean tag uh, members and the EPI members uh, to, to review the readiness uh, for introduction and deployment of vaccines and some of the other issues uh, that are shown here. In the final uh, slide or final part of, of this slide down the bottom, you'll see reference to the tremendous commitment that the uh, 27 self-financing countries have already made uh, in budgetary and financial resources to the global facility. Uh, down payments or upfront payments uh, of more than $433 million has been made to the facility for approximately eight or nine countries in the Caribbean, these down, down uh, payments or upfront payments uh, were supported by CARFA from its EU uh, agreement. So thank you CARFA and EU for supporting member states uh, in the Caribbean with their down, down or upfront payments. In addition, the 27 member states also had to uh, commit, provide a financial guarantee or risk sharing guarantee, which amounted to about $673 million. Uh, dollars. Uh, and, and this is supported uh, uh, depending on the, the, the uh, nature of the individual agreements by the Ministry of Finance, by the National Bank, et cetera, uh, on paper ensuring that uh, each uh, member state was in a position to uh, actually move forward with purchasing of the vaccine 
which would begin to start as early as the first quarter of 2021. Overall, we're projecting that close to this final line down the bottom, that close to uh, $2 billion uh, will be uh, <clears throat> uh, potentially needed during uh, the course of 2021 uh, to, to procure the um, COVID-19 vaccine for our member states. Um, and, and this is uh, all countries uh, in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, so as we look ahead to 2021 and introducing the new vaccine, we are uh, 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 bracing for uh, supply constraints at, and um, and, and this will be a challenge at the global level and also uh, at the regional level and national level as we move forward. This is important to recognize because initially the WHO allocation model uh, will be allocating 3% of country needs. Um, and later on in the year, depending on availability, that will grow to meet additional needs within each uh, country uh, population and plan. Um, we, we expect in the green bubble here that uh, suppliers of vaccines, such as the ones mentioned in the earlier presentations, will have different pricing strategies. And these will become known or become clearer as we receive more offers, such as what I mentioned in, in the previous uh, slide. Um, and uh, some suppliers will offer single prices and others may offer tiering of prices based on income classification of countries. Uh, so uh, one of the key decisions by our ministries of health at our directing a special session of our directing council on the 10th of December was to uh, enable uh, or, uh, flexibility by the PAHO revolving fund to negotiate uh, based on what it sees uh, in, uh, in, in, in coordination with Gavi and uh, UNICEF. Uh, at, th at this juncture, it's very important at the bottom that we not, <clears throat> um, that, that we stay at the table given the urgency for access. Uh, we believe our member states cannot afford delays in accessing available doses. So PAHO will continue to advocate for the lowest possible prices uh, and will continue to um, <clears throat> work with member states through the different governance mechanisms uh, that are in place for the global COVAX facility uh, to help carry that message. And finally, on the far left, in the black box, you'll see references to the facility and the variation of countries in the facility that have access to vaccines and the 2 billion doses that I mentioned earlier in terms of our target delivery for next year. Uh, these uh, <clears throat> countries from Europe, uh, from Asia, including Japan, uh, Korea, et cetera, uh, come from a variety of income levels. Um, and, and so this, this is part of the reasoning for our an, uh, anticipation that we're liable to see a tiering of prices uh, as um, offers come into 
uh, or in response to our international tender. Finally, uh, I, I will touch a little bit here on uh, to supplement was which was mentioned earlier uh, on uh, Dr. Molina's slide on PAHO's technical cooperation and support of countries. So here in this slide, you have uh, five areas of, of work uh, that our headquarters and country offices are working on in supporting uh, ministries of health from regulatory aspects and allocation of doses uh, to immunization policy and vaccine delivery strategies to vaccine supply, logistics, and cold chain, much of which I just shared with you from the point of view of vaccine demand and supply in the earlier slides, to communication, community engagement, demand generation within the population, much of which uh, Dr. Uh, Molina spoke about, and of course, advocacy and resource mobilization. Uh, this is a snapshot of uh, the uh, monitoring tool that countries are, are currently reviewing and planning for. So you have up top, uh, and this is a snapshot uh, from the tool and progress being made within the region. And so you have 10 or 15 countries shown here and uh, you have the various indicators in the column on the left, and then a snapshot on how countries are progressing uh, with uh, their monitoring in support of their national uh, immunization uh, <clears throat> development initiatives for, for receipt of the COVID vaccine. <clears throat> Sorry. And then finally, I'll close with our overall strategy for introduction of the COVID-19 vaccine here in the Americas. This is pillar 10 to our emergency response and the priority uh, lines of action that are shown here. One, to strengthen uh, mechanisms for regula re regulation and oversight of the novel uh, COVID-19 vaccine across their entire life cycle. Two, to reinforce immunization policies and vaccine delivery strategies. Three, to procure the vaccines for countries in this region, to address supply needs, improve logistics, and reinforce uh, necessary improvements to the cold chain. Uh, to four, to um, strengthen communication efforts to address vaccine hesitancy as well as community engagement. And lastly, to advocate on behalf of our member states to ensure equitable access and allocation of vaccines. Uh, so thank you very much again for this opportunity and we'll stand by for any questions. Over. by for any questions. Over. Thank you very much for your presentation and uh, for the facilitation being done by the Pan American Health Organization, organization certainly in collaboration with the countries. What we will do at this time is to, to take a short perhaps five minutes, and then we will get back to our uh, presenters uh, with any questions from from the floor. I think well, we we'll have a working break. It would appear so. We will just provide. The, we will provide the, the break to persons at, at their seating area and we will 
likely go into the question and answer segment. So I'll, tell, I'll ask the presenters to, to stay tuned. Uh, do we have any, any initial questions from the floor for any of our presenters? For any of our presenters? Go on with the mic and then. We have a question. Hello. Uh, thank you. First of all, I want to thank all the presenters for such a wonderful and precise presentation. Uh, I have a question for De Dr. Levis. Um, I have a question for Dr. Levis. Yeah, uh, Doc, I just wanted to, um, you know, uh, understand about this uh, antibody titers. So uh, the efficacy of the vaccine, as we know, we are testing based on uh, what antibody responses the patient's body makes uh, after getting the booster. Uh, after three months or so, we check the antibodies, and we know that, okay, there's a good response which has come from the titers. Um, but uh, I'm thinking about, now we know that almost 70 million population is already affected worldwide you know, from uh, this COVID infection. So, um, and one million we have lost, but uh, rest of them are either recovering or they have recovered or they are still hospitalized. Now, if we have to vaccinate people, are we going to, for about those who have recovered or those who have uh, had the infection in the past or those who are recovering, uh, would there be a strategy launch that we would be doing antibody titers for them first and see what is their current, um, you know, whether the natural infection has given them some antibodies and then, and then go for the vaccination, or we are just going to vaccinate, uh, you know, people just like that. I mean, I just want to understand that. Would that uh, strategy be there in future, or we would be going in for vaccination in general okay. without consideration of the titers? So thank you for that question. It's actually a, a pretty good question. So um, essentially the concern is, if you would have gotten a coronavirus infection previously, would that have left you with some kind of your body have memory to fight that infection another time, right? So I, the, the, the best I can answer is this. Because the illness is so new, we still don't know how long lasting uh, an immunological protection having the infection itself gives you. So I would imagine if you've caught the coronavirus now, it would give you some protection for a period, but we don't know how long that period uh, would have been. Um, in terms of the vaccine itself, right now we're, we're currently having people in stage three trials getting the vaccination now. So what we can do, we can get antibody titers on those people to see what their immunological response to the vaccine is. How long that protection is going to last for, we don't know. So to, uh, to attempt to answer your question, a person could have caught coronavirus or the coronavirus, and after a certain number of years, they may still require a vaccination so that if they are exposed to it again, they don't get the same kind of illness or the same kind of symptoms that they would have gotten the first time. It is a possibility. We just don't know yet. It's too new. So I was saying the answer to your question also involves a question of cost, because you can do an antibody test and the test is positive, but what's the quantity of antibody that, that, that you have? That's a quantitative test, which in fact may be more expensive. I happened to have found myself at a hospital somewhere in the UK, and I said, yeah, I'm immunized against um, hepatitis B. So they said, um, did you do a quantitative test? I said, I said, what are you talking about? They said, yeah, we need to know if you're a good responder or not. And as it turned out, for me to have had that test done was more expensive than for me to get another job. So they just gave me another job and said, go to work. <laughs> Thank 
thank you very much for the question and responses. I would ask the persons asking questions to just briefly identify themselves. We have another. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diane Lalo Rodriguez. I'm the director of the Antigua and Barbuda Bureau of Standards. Um, and my question is one which is sort of non-medical and relates to the whole issue of labeling, which has raised its head with respect to the vaccines that may be supplied through the UN procurement agencies, and I think also otherwise. And um, asking if probably from PAHO, PAHO or maybe even Dr. Lewis, what what would you suggest as uh, the approach to, to dealing with this? Now, we have general labeling standards, but there might also be some specifics that would be required in, in this case. And then we also have the issue of inspection of that labeling when those items do um, land in Antigua. Thank you. Sorry, you addressed it generally or? So do we have any response from the Pan American Health Organization in, res in relation to the issue of labeling? I'm not sure if they had heard. Sorry? Uh, sorry, sorry. It's, 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 we are not hearing the questions. We are not hearing, you know, I think the person if someone is having a question for us, uh, they need to take a microphone. Yeah, the, the mic was given, I'm not sure. The question was from the Director of the Bureau of Standards in relation to the issue of labeling. Uh, of the, the issue of what, sorry? Labeling. So, sorry, I cannot. So the issue in relation to labeling. Um, I, I could uh, try to answer that. So, uh, hi, John Fitzsimmons here at the Revolving Fund on labeling. So this is part of the review that, that's ongoing uh, with the receipt of offers from suppliers and the appropriate labeling um, uh, that is found in the presentation that's being presented by the supplier and the review of that. Uh, WHO in a recent communication uh, suggested that countries consider model labeling and use model labeling in terms of clearing through the regulatory process. Uh, in, in the Caribbean, it's a, a regional regulatory process review. And so this will be one of the various factors along with the others that I mentioned uh, during the discussion uh, uh, of the uh, international uh, of the offers that would be considered appropriate labeling by uh, the suppliers of the candidate vaccine. Hope that helps to address the question. Over. Uh, thank you very much for that response. Is there follow up, Mrs. Rodriguez, or is that? Do we have any? Are there, are there specifics that are being required outside of our normal labeling process? I'm not sure if you heard that, the, the follow-up question. Are, are there, there any, any uh, specifics, specifics or particular specifications outside of what is Normal. Could you repeat the question again? Yes. Are there any specific outside of what would be the normal labor requirement? Uh, no. no. Are these are left to the individual? Question? Correct. Okay. 
Thank you for the answer. We have a question. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joyce Van Walter Thomas. I'm a consultant pediatrician with the medical division of the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and the Environment. My question is, I know that there are many vaccines that are being developed and many in trial. Uh, most of these vaccines are for adult use from the research that I've seen. Are there any vaccines that are specifically being looked at in context of um, use by children? This should be a question to Paho. Over. All right, just uh, I'm not sure if you heard the question again. This is in relation to uh, vaccines to be used by children. Uh, most of the vaccines uh, in adults. And therefore, there's a question as to how it should be used. Okay. We, we couldn't hear you well. It's, it's about vaccination in children. Yeah. So, yeah. So most, most of the vaccines haven't been tested in children before 12 years old. However, uh, in the last month, uh, there were a couple of uh, clinical trials, including children over 12 years old. So the plan is in uh, the following months after the vaccines are introduced, that uh, depending on the performance of the safety performance and effect and efficiency and effectiveness performance, uh, we will may, may, maybe some uh, manufacturers will include uh, children's children's less than 12, 12 years old. But at the moment, uh, the only uh, children population it's adolescents is under 18 years old from 12 years old. So we have data, we will have data on that population. So there's no plans to include them by now for the moment. I, I don't know if that... Had... Because I couldn't hear it well. We, we heard you quite well. Thank you very much okay. for the response. Uh, if there's any follow-up, uh, I think Dr. George. Hello. So we have a question to the CMO. Um, well, first of all, let me congratulate the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and the Environment in conjunction with PAHO for such a great session. Very, very needed. And my question speaks towards... Um, the vaccination, whichever um, one is approved, would this be mandatory for all healthcare workers? And what would your approach be to healthcare workers who may refuse to be vaccinated? Testing, testing. What was the question, sorry? That was a question to our chief medical officer. The, the question was whether or not vaccines will be mandatory. The answer is no. Vaccines in Antigua will be voluntary. This is why we have embarked on a program of information and education of the public. We believe that is a better way to go. As a matter of fact, after the 
cabinet in enunciated that policy, PAHO, uh, WHO actually, came out and suggested that it should not be mandatory. And we are going to have to work hard to persuade at least 70% of the population that vaccine uh, should be the best option, should be seen as the best option in uh, really uh, winning this battle over COVID. Do you want to add anything? Sorry, Dr. George, I didn't answer your question. What was the follow-up one? What was it, the second part of your question? What would be the approach for medical personnel um, if they don't act? No, just in, in general. Okay. So um, WHO has recommended that we prioritize um, the administration of the vaccine and healthcare workers and vulnerable populations, particularly the elderly. For healthcare workers, um, we would uh, focus those in, on those in our institutions, for example, our hospital, the Mount St. John Medical Center, the Clevedon Psychiatric Hospital, and the Fines Institute. And then we'll focus us on those healthcare professionals who are in our community health clinics, and then, of course, those in the private sector. Um, so we'll have a rollout, we hope, of a simultaneous rollout within all those institutions and organizations. What, what's going on with the... Hello? Yeah, I just, I just want to make a point regarding what was said earlier as a follow-up to the question that, is, that, that was just raised, a question of, of compliance or people's willingness to take the vaccine. Because in my opinion, while today is a start, you have a very, very long way to go. I mentioned earlier that um, Dr. Christian is the only molecular biologist in Antigua. And quite frankly, we're going to have to have some serious molecular biology 101 um, sessions with the public for them to understand this new vaccine. Because there are some fears regarding this vaccine. There are some fears regarding the vaccine since it's messenger, sorry, messenger RNA. Um, it's not DNA, but people get DNA and RNA um, totally mixed up, you know. Um, for example, we need to, to make, make the point. In fact, some people make the point to you once you begin to talk about DNA, that the difference between us humans and worms is that we use roughly the same amount to make proteins, and the proteins are similar. But it is the architecture or, or the control of these genes which separates us humans from, from, from worms, for example. And they're quite rightly concerned about the molecular biology aspect of it. We have to let them know we're not dealing with DNA, uh, um, DNA. we're dealing with RNA. And the RNA, in fact, is in fact synthetic. So when they say they don't want something unnatural in, in their body, they are in fact, it's unnatural. We have to have detailed discussions about this new molecular biology and the safety of it. So today, in my opinion, this is just a start, and it's a good way to go in terms of explaining this, this uh, vaccine in clear, detailed molecular biology terms. Not at this time. Thank you very much. Not me either. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I think we had. Sarah? Hello. Good day to everyone. Everyone can hear me. Um, I am Anansha McDonald, Public Relations Officer of the Ministry of Health and Wellness and the Environment. Good afternoon to everyone. Great discussion so far. I have a few questions that are coming from the general public. Um, the vaccine, will it contain an MRC5 property, which is the lung tissue 
of aborted fetuses. That's a question that's been going around on social media. And um, any iatrogenic reactions. MRC5, which is the fetal lung tissue of aborted fetuses. That's a concern in social media. Um, and I know the minister discussed that the vaccine will not be mandatory for the general public, but if you have to travel for travel purposes, are you going to be required to take the vaccine? And um, will the general public be made aware of persons who are affected adversely by the vaccination, if that is any one of the outcomes? Those are some questions I see floating around on social media. And um, Dr. Lewis or anybody from the CMO panel can answer these questions. All right, so just to encapsulate that, I think there were three basic questions. One would be in relation to the origin of the vaccine, as in the uh, mRNA type of vaccine. Now, of course, there are several types of vaccines, the first of which is the mRNA type. There was also a question in relation to... Travel, I have them. Uh, travel, and I, I think certainly that is one that can be ad addressed as well uh, from Pahu or any of the participants here. And your third question, the reporting of adverse reactions. Right. So the reporting of adverse reactions, the origin of the vaccine, and certainly requirements by countries in relation to travel. So okay. would I think yeah. the CMO will, will start, and then if we have any follow-up from our online um, participants, we'll take them. CMO? I want to deal with, uh, with two of the questions, the one about mandatory travel and adverse reactions. So it's very um, difficult. OK. Yeah, for travel, um, some countries may make it uh, mandatory that um, Persons visiting their countries have to have a, a vaccine for, have, would have to have been immunized for COVID-19. As it is now, for example, for yellow fever, for you to enter some countries, if you're coming from an area where um, a, a yellow fever is endemic, you have to have a, 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 an international um, certificate of vaccination for yellow fever. I believe that that is, will become the case for COVID-19. It's difficult to say what countries would require in the future with regard to COVID-19. But I, th I think that is a trend that we are going to see in that if you want to, for example, travel from, say, Antigua and Barbuda to another country, and we have an ongoing on outbreak in the country, you might find that that country might ask for vaccination certificates specific for COVID. And in, with regard to adverse reactions, of course, yes, we will be monitoring and we monitor our vaccine, vaccination program here for adverse reactions, and we would be willing to publish not the, speci <laughs> not the specifics in terms of who would have had an, an adverse reaction, of course, because there's confidentiality, but we would update the public regularly on the number of adverse reactions and the nature of those adverse reactions. That's something that the Ministry of Health will be very transparent with while preserving the confidentiality of patients. I think Dr. Lewis might be able to answer the one about the, the first question that you had. I think we need to define I think we need to define adverse reaction because a fever is that seen an adverse reaction? From your early presentation, Dr. Lewis, it would indicate that is a sign that the body is responding. So uh, we need to put adverse reaction in a context. If they're terms that are being confused, because of course, when, when, when they say adverse reaction in a clinical trial, talk about any sign of sickness that we show while a person is involved in the trial. Now, those signs of symptoms may include the signs of symptoms that are expected, the things that we as scientists believe that should ordinarily happen. But of course, because it's such a strict documentation process in the clinical trial, you have to note everything. Even though it's something that's an expected reaction, something that you think is supposed to happen, you still have to list it by law. You can't omit it because it's expected. Uh, the next thing is, of course, if anything happens to the patient in the clinical trial, 
even if it's not related to the vaccine, it still has to be listed as well. So if, for, for instance, they're taking the vaccine and the person's toe has a toe fungus, they have to put toe fungus may be a side effect because it happened during the clinical trial, even if it has nothing to do with the vaccine. Um, to answer the other question about the MRC5, uh, that was a, a fluke. It's not true. It's, it's categorically not true. It's a fluke that happened on social media. It's another product of social media advertising where uh, a social media uh, presenter, I, I would call them, I would dignify them and call them that, a social media presenter, uh, showed a slide of the AstraZeneca, the Oxford um, vaccine, and its components, and then switched over to a, a listing that, uh, that, that had in it that the AstraZeneca vaccine, whatever its title was, uh, was tested in a male uh, unborn fetus in these cells, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's, it's completely not true. It was a, a snippet or a picture taken from two completely separate studies and pasted together on, um, on social media. It's, it's not true. All right, thank you very much. I think there was, uh, in one of the presentations from PAHO, there's a reporting system, system for adverse for reactions. I don't know if you wanted to elaborate a little bit on that. I think Dr. Molina, you had addressed yeah. that. Yeah, so the idea is that the idea is that each country has, uh, impl has in place a reporting system. Antigua and Barbuda has one, but each country in the region have more or less developed a system, regional system for detecting uh, adverse events following immunization. In, in the manual we are, we are publishing, there will be guidance on how to detect what kind of events the, a medical doctor should report to the uh, surveillance system. And then after that, uh, after an event is reported, the country uh, should have the capacity to investigate that event, to uh, do a causality assessment by a national committee that uh, will help them to know if the event was related or not to the vaccine and then to run data analysis uh, when they have more than one case, uh, to run statistical analysis, aggregate analysis on the cases that they detect. Also, uh, we are planning to promote a regional system. That system will need the countries to report all the individual cases to PAHO. In that way, we can uh, detect signals related to uh, any vaccine. When you have aggregate data, I mean, when you have more than uh, 100 cases, you're able to see patterns in that data. So the idea is that we want to be able to see if in the data we can uh, start to see uh, signals, we call it signals, signal, signals, it's like any new events that uh, could have, could have been, couldn't have been detected or seen in clinical trials that uh, are occurring uh, new. So uh, in that way, with the data analysis, uh, with some data analysis techniques, we can know if that's working. So the idea is that in the country has a system in place and there's a regional system and also the WHO it's, uh, has its own system, which is, uh, is leaded, it's run by the Uppsala Monitoring Center of Sweden. They collect the data from uh, adverse drug reactions from uh, all the countries in the world. And they have also worldwide signal detection systems. So it, in that way, they can, if they receive the data on vaccines, uh, complete data on vaccines, it, they can uh, see if there's a, a, any pattern of new events occurring related to vaccines. So what countries should commit to is to have quality in their data, to implement digital systems, to improve the quality of the data they are collecting, and also to transfer data to the upper uh, levels, to the regional and to the global system. So I don't know if that Thank you very much. I think that expands on, on the, the question in terms of reporting of 
of adverse events at the national, the regional, and international levels. Are there, what we'll ask, oh, do you have a mic already? Yes. So, good afternoon. My name is Alfred Attil, the Director of Pharmaceutical Services in the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and the Environment. I'd just like to follow up on um, a question I was asked via the social media about vaccinating or vaccines requirement for travel. Now, I, I heard that the CMO's response, but what I'm looking at is the initial rollout of the vaccine would be targeting specific groups of persons. Now, if, you, if an individual who wants to travel falls outside of that group, that is where I think the, the challenge for us as a ministry would be. And I am hoping that we can work around the, the, the logistics of that, uh, because I, I don't think you would want to deny someone f to travel if they do not fall within that grouping within that time period when the vaccine numbers do not fall outside of that. Thank you very much, Ms. Sanford. Uh-huh. Right. To, to travel? That's a decision that we would have to make that we'd have to make. Depends on the travel, the nature of the travel. What I'm saying is that the guidelines set for persons to get the vaccine in the initial phase. Yes. If I fall within or outside of those guidelines, how would I access the vaccine if I need to travel? Well, you could well, I'd access the vaccine through the Ministry of Health and we'll is a, a discussion that will be ongoing and it will have to of course depend on the nature of your travel whether it's for an emergency purpose or you know that kind of thing would have to be taken into those factors would need to be taken into consideration but to put I to, to make a blanket statement that if you're outside a priority group and you want to travel for vacation and you need a vaccine I mean those are things we need to discuss further and this is the first of our um, public consultation and public education so that we have um, situations such as that that we will take into consideration as we move forward. Yes, we are already at that stage because that's what happens with yellow fever. All right, so there was a, a question on the, the notice board about prolonged exposure. What, what is termed prolonged exposure? And uh, what, what would you say there's, what amount of time, I guess the question is, would we consider to be prolonged exposure to a vaccine? So historically speaking, whenever the, the clinical trials happen in sequence, when you move from phases, uh, preclinical trials to phases two, three, and, and, and then four, Stage four simply is the long-term observation of the effects of, of, of the patients who would have received that vaccine and if they ever later on in their, their lives developed any uh, adverse effects or any new symptoms or any illnesses because they would have been vaccinated. That is, if you can prove a correlation between any new illnesses and, and them being vaccinated. Now, there's no set time on what prolonged exposure is. That's why they say, um, stage four is just ongoing. So it could be a year after, it could be two years after, it could be 10 years after. There's no real limit on it. I mean, that, to say that would mean you think a person only has 10 more years of life. Somebody could get a vaccine at age 20, and we want to know if there's any adverse effects in them when they're 40, when they're 50. So it, it really is an ongoing thing and something that will be measured for a very, 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 very long time to come. Yes, please. 
Hi, good afternoon. Patrice Simon for the Hotel Association, representing the Hotel Association. When the vaccine is rolled out, how does that affect uh, what change the quarantine requirements? So we have to remember that quarantine is uh, a period where you monitor a person um, and during the incubation of the disease to see whether or not they would develop, develop any symptoms. If somebody would have been vaccinated against COVID-19, the expectation is that they would not um, be, uh, the body would have mounted an immune response and they will not be infectious, hopefully. So they will not need to be monitored per se as, well, as closely as somebody who would have not been vaccinated. Um, because we're gonna be rolling out a vaccine, uh, limited, limited rollout in terms of healthcare workers and other vul um, vulnerable persons, and the entire population would not be um, vaccinated immediately. The quarantine would have to remain for a while, and uh, certainly until we reach that 70%, where we uh, would be sort of guaranteed herd immunity that would have been mentioned in the previous presentation. So to think that because we're gonna get um, vaccines that quarantine is gonna go away or it won't be, no. We have to make sure that we maintain quarantine and other public health and social measures until we develop that am amount of herd immunity for the community. So wearing of masks, as, um, so, uh, physical distancing, social distancing, th those things, those measures would have to continue until we get to a level where we can feel safe that the population So I was going to add that herd immunity, in fact, in all cases, is not just a numbers game. It's a real life game in terms of, you know, having got the vaccine, do you have the numbers in terms of antibodies? And the numbers don't say everything. Are you, in fact, protected? And the only way to know that is to make sure that you don't get COVID. And only time can tell you that. So you're going to have to have all the measures still in place until we can see in real terms. These people have been vaccinated and they have not, in fact, contracted a, a, a COVID. So a lot of studies will still have to be done um, while, when we start the vaccine and after we start the vaccine. It's really early days. Uh, very good morning. Um, I'm gonna try to speak as loudly because sometimes the sound doesn't go through. Uh, my name is Garfield Burford, ABS. Um, I'll, ask three I'll ask three questions for myself, and then uh, I'll ask for those who are online as well, because there's an active conversation happening online. You want me to? Sorry. You oh, I sound there? Okay. Should I do power? Very good morning. Um, oh, loud. Uh, okay, so I'll ask uh, three questions for myself first, and then I'll ask questions that have uh, uh, come in through our, uh, our Facebook page. An active conversation happening on Facebook, certainly. Uh, some of the uh, points which have been raised were not quite questions, but so, some of them were comments, uh, persons back and forth with uh, opposing views on it. Firstly, my questions, three of them. Uh, one in relation to uh, side effects, fish, sorry, facial palsy, for example, is a, a concern which has been raised that four people have developed that from the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Is that a concern based uh, specifically? Uh, one, two, uh, just in the last few hours in the UK, the health minister there, Mr. Matt Hancock, has indicated that there has been a new strain of COVID or coronavirus which has been detected in London and which has been spreading rapidly. Is there a concern that this vaccine, whichever the vaccine identified, may not necessarily give the same level of effectiveness, efficacy against all possible strains of COVID-19? And finally, in relation to uh, the COVAX facility, we've heard before, perhaps in the last week and a half, that the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna vaccines will not be a part of COVAX, but the AstraZeneca one will be. Is that still the case? 
And if it's still the case, why not? And I'll ask either to, um, to Paho or to Dr. Celia Thomas. Well, Paho. So I'll ask that of Paho first, whether or not the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna vaccines are still uh, excluded from um, the, uh, the COVAX facility. And if that's the case, why is that the case at this point? All right, so those two questions first, and then I'll ask for, for Facebook. Yep. Do you want me to answer first, John? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. The first question related to fa facial palsy in clinical trial trials related in uh, with the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. So there has been four cases out of uh, more than uh, 1,000 uh, patients involved in the clinical trial uh, receiving the vaccine. So. Uh, regarding the report of the manufacturer, the causality assessment has uh, told that uh, these facial policies can be considered coincidental events, however, uh, or events not related to the vaccine. So as you know, facial policy, it's, um, it's a, a frequent condition that can be caused by uh, unspecific related events can so can be can appear at any time uh, in any person. So at the moment, there is no there is no uh, reason to think that it's been it's related to the vaccine. However, uh, as you might know, the one the recommendations from regulatory authorities such as FDA uh, that has approved recently the vaccine is that. Uh, the patients in clinical trials should be followed up and uh, these kind of events should be monitored. Uh, we need to see more and to follow more the patients, uh, more patients to see if that could be an event caused by the vaccine. But for the moment, what, what we know it is, is that it's considered a very, could be considered a very rare event and at the moment, we don't have uh, data, or we don't have uh, enough evidence to say that it's related to the vaccine. But uh, we must still continue following up patients and we must continue to see what happens with other clinical trials with the same vaccine. So I need to see, uh, I, I, that's the way, that's what I can respond. And the other uh, question was related a, what was, it? sorry, can you, you remind me? Sure, the, the next one in relation to COVAX, whether or not the Pfizer-BioNTech. I can't hear you. Okay, sorry. hearing me better? Hearing me better? No, I can't Oh, jeez. Um, not sure if that has anything. Yes, uh, hoping you can hear me better now, whether or not the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna vaccines are, are still excluded from uh, the COVAX facility, and if that's the case, why? Hi, uh, yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, John Fitzsimmons here again. Uh, so the AstraZeneca and Moderna are, are, uh, are part of the uh, facility, as was stated. And uh, just to reconfirm that, and, and in relation to the Pfizer vaccine, uh, discussions are underway. Over. One, one last one. In relation to allergies, those with allergies, some persons have developed uh, some uh, pretty severe reactions, certainly reported so far. We cannot uh, hear you, sorry. Oh, um, sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. You hear, able to hear me better? Or if you, if you can type the question. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, all right, perhaps I'll, I'll ask this one of... Uh, Hoping you can hear me better. Right, in relation to the allergies, those with allergies, is there a concern that PAHO has that those with allergies may face severe reactions from whichever vaccine is used? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, I couldn't hear you, but I think it's better if you can type it. Because I, the, I think the microphone has a problem. While it's being typed, and thank you so much, Dr. Christian, may I ask one internally of, uh, in relation to, from our health, uh, health authorities, either Minister or CMO or Dr. Simon or Dr. Dr. Lewis. Uh, the, this question came in on social media. The vaccine has MRC5 in it. 
I suppose that's, that's a question, although there was no question sign. Secondly, is there a latrogenic reaction? Iatrogenic. Sorry? Iatrogenic is the kind. Oh, I see. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> is, is there a reaction? Allergic reaction. So in the, in the uh, how will they be addressed by Pa? Okay, thank you. Just, just uh, in the in the manual we are we are publishing, we will providing recommendations on how to how to detect and how to uh, manage severe allergic reactions. Uh, this is not a new uh, issue that we are facing. In, for previous vaccine, as you know, for any vaccine, there could be components of that vaccine that could cause allergic reactions for some uh, some persons. So what uh, one of the recommendations related to the immunization program is that uh, subjects that are, or children that are vaccinated, and in this case will be the same, the same, the same thing, will be, should be observed for a certain amount of time after they are vaccinated, they, they are vaccinated in case they, uh, they make an allergic reaction. Also, um, we have we are going to provide we are going to provide guidance on on what kind of medicines and what kind of uh, uh, of uh, sign or symptoms should a patient have a, whenever there is an allergic reaction. So there's a the, in the manual we will providing some guidance on that and we'll be recommending on the programs to insist on the detection and management of allergic reactions at the way we are doing it. So I don't know if that addressed the question. If not, I can stay in more. Okay. Uh, back and answer the other questions that you were having. Firstly, we, we answered before. I know it wasn't with this mic, so probably it wasn't transmitted well. Um, um, that was uh, an erroneous uh, social media posting where they were saying that the AstraZeneca vaccine contained um, components of MRC5, which is uh, aborted fetal lung tissue. So no, it's not, it's not true. It has, has been since posting, it has been found to, to have been rejected as, as being untrue. And Excuse me. I am sorry, I cannot hear you. I cannot hear you well. I think the microphone has a problem there. If you can change the microphone and if you can type the question, sorry. Okay. Awesome. Just if you if you can type it down. Okay, and um, in terms of iatrogenic reaction, so the term iatrogenia means uh, the healthcare provider themselves is doing something to cause harm to the patient, because these vaccines are still in trial in trial stages, they're not in mass production yet, they're not being given to, to patients other than for the emergency use in the UK. There haven't been any reports of healthcare induced um, adverse reactions in patients just yet. During the clinical trials, I haven't read in my personal reading or research any uh, instances where the healthcare providers or the administrators of the vaccines were actually causing um, adverse effects in any of the patients in the trial so far. from social media. Uh, there's two quick questions from social media. Well, some of them are pretty much kind of rhetorical questions. Some of them are comments. Uh, one is in relation to a point which was raised earlier on our Facebook page. Sorry, we cannot hear you. Okay, so we'll get us in again. That, um, yeah. Hello, good. Hello. Yeah, it's okay. Um, 
we can syndicate that. So it's questions for the internal body, for the internal panel. Is that question for Not necessarily. So we're just indicating to him that it's questions for the internal panel. Okay, thanks. Okay, so just a, a, a quick point which was raised earlier. So why will recipients of this particular vaccine be tracked via electronic means? Sorry, this is not. This is one thing I am not with you guys on. Do what it is that you must do, but please do not make it mandatory, as will shortly be mandated by Babylon and its allies. This this one came in earlier, so I think the point was raised by Minister um, uh, Minister Joseph earlier that it will not be mandatory. But the point, well, a point was raised about whether or not those with the vaccine will be tracked electronically. There's another point which was raised. Uh, Earlier, the human body is capable of fighting any sickness proven over the hundreds of years that we have been on this planet. This person suggesting that vaccines may not be uh, necessary. And the other point, finally, which I'd mentioned, which came in on our uh, social media page as well, all those vaccines that you guys are referencing, such as, for example, in the CMO's presentation regarding poliomyelitis, etc., were developed over a lengthy period of time there is no comparison with this one. I don't know uh, why you realize that the immune system, the person was essentially saying that this vaccine is taking too long, uh, too short a time to be developed. So one, on the length of time this vaccine has taken, that was a significant concern. And two, the point was raised about whether or not there is any electronic tracking of those who will be uh, getting the vaccine. And in terms of the other one uh, regarding the length, of, of course, this is one of the biggest questions that the public has. Uh, is this vaccine safe? It has not gone through the length of time if you're using time as the only metric to measure the success of a vaccine. It hasn't been around long enough, just like the illness hasn't been around long enough. You're looking at, a, uh, in terms of polio, polio's been around for decades, coronavirus has been around for months. We haven't even gone through a year with coronavirus yet. So. Um, the next thing is you have to look at world impact and the availability of world resources. So in the, uh, when polio was the, the big thing on the block and <clears throat> that's what we were all fighting, we had nowhere near the kind of resources that we have today, <clears throat> excuse me, including the amount of actual professionals working and who are tasked to the, to the particular illness. Um, secondly, it's not so much that the development of these vaccines are going through the clinical trials in sequence, the way that they have historically been done with all the other vaccines, and we're just kind of skipping through all the processes. So instead of us going through stages one, two, three, at the beginning of clinical trials in stage one, we're just giving you the vaccine. That's not, that's not the case. It has to go through all of the elements of clinical trials before it can be deemed safe for public use. Uh, the only reason why it seems like it's so quick with this one is that some of the stages are being tested in parallel as opposed to in sequence. That's one of the reasons why it seems like it's so fast. So it's not so much that we're cheating the testing process or the clinical trial process. We've just, through research and through technological development, been able to conduct these studies in, uh, in parallel. So we can do a bunch of things at the same time as opposed to waiting for one to be done to start the other. Essentially, just think of it as we're teaching you first, second, and third form math in first form. And you still have to take the same exam at the end knowing first form, second form, and third form math. We're not just giving you the exam after going through first form, hoping that you would automatically just know second and third. Well, I think part of the problem is that for the, last, for, the last, for the last many years, there's been so much work done in molecular biology regarding vaccine, but it's not known. So it seems as if we are now doing something new. Yeah. Yes, the messenger RNA is relatively new, but a lot of work has gone on over the last 10, 20 years regarding molecular biology to lead us to this particular point. Let me ask a question. Um, uh, Dr. Lewis, in connection with this point, even if you develop the technology, don't you need the circumstances under which you test the technology and then how could you do it if you don't have a pandemic? How could you um, really determine the efficacy 
of a vaccine unless you have the circumstances where you can do the trials and so forth and test it? No, agreed. Uh, um, without the COVID-19 pandemic, there would not be this push, there would not be um, all this resource allocation, financial allocation, human resource allocation to develop the vaccine. So we're, we're in unprecedented times, and the solution is going to be unprecedented. It's something new. It's not to say that the safeguards are being cheated. It's just that the process itself is being given more attention. It's been given more priority. So it seems to be going a bit faster. Uh, the technology is, in fact, new. So it is untested in terms of length of time. So a lot of times, the public is looking at the, the metric of success as, has this thing been tested long enough for us to be sure that it is actually safe? And there's no way for you to cheat time. We have no time machines where we can accelerate and go to 2045 and see what the effects of all this stuff is going to be. I mean, I wish I had one, because I'd love to play the lotto, but it, there's no way to cheat time. There's some of these things we just have to wait and we have to see. Just like Dr. Sam was saying before, uh, some of these trials are going to be going on in stage four, where we're tracking the success of the actual vaccines for years to come, and there's no way for us to cheat that and, and, and look forward and see it. But here's an interesting point. This messenger RNA technology, surprise, surprise, is not just for COVID. This messenger RNA technology is also for the big C, for cancer. We'll talk about that in more detail. One thing, Dr. Christian, I think somebody asked about tracking electronically. Yeah. Right. Um, the only tracking that's been done from a Ministry of Health point of view, we will be following up persons who would get the vaccine for any adverse events. That's the tracking. They're talking uh, about the Bill Gates theory, that, that Bill Gates is going to be monitoring the world. Well, the only tracking that the Ministry of Health will be engaging in is tracking for I adverse events no electronic chip or anything like that. And we have, uh, yeah. we have a question um, here. Yes. yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Rawson Jeffrey. I'm from the Antiguan Barbie Evangelical Alliance. I'd like to, first of all, commend the government of Antigua Barbie and the and ministry for hosting this event today. Our, I'm old enough to know that, that um, vaccine and vaccination is not anything new. I, in fact, a few years ago I was traveling to Africa and I had to get a, a vaccine uh, to travel. But what, what appears to me now is that with this uh, COVID-19 and the question of a, a vaccine, uh, there seems to be a lot of apprehension, a lot of anxiety uh, in, in the community rightly or wrongly. Uh, are there any mechanisms apart from, from this to sort of alleviate uh, the fears which are outside there? And what is it that the ministry has to do uh, to sort of bring some sort of semblance to the situation? Yes, sir. That's my question. I think, I think the question was, is there anything that the ministry can do to alleviate the fears? Yes, exactly. So I, I, I will say this much. I think at the advent of any pandemic, at the beginning of any global catastrophe in terms of an illness, there's always skepticism about the treatment. I can imagine that although people were seeing the devastating effects of polio, when the, the, the WHO first came out and said, hey, there's a vaccine for this now, that there was some apprehension. There's probably some fear. Listen, how are you going to be vaccinating, what are you doing? Are you taking the same thing that's made my child look like that and putting it in me? I don't want you to do that. So th there's always going to be the apprehension about the unknown. Until people actually see the effects of it, I don't think the complete aspect of fear is going to go. The best we can do is provide the public with accurate information and hope to alleviate some of the skepticism, but the overall fear just won't vanish until people have seen the, the actual work of the vaccine. It's unfortunate, but peeps, uh, uh, today, I, I know you represent the Evangelical Alliance, but today, faith is in short supply amongst the society. They, they have to see to believe. 
that I, don't, I don't think it's unfortunate what's happening out there. I mean, people are rightly concerned, and they have all right to, to, to be, because this is molecular vaccine we're talking about. And the key to any vaccine, even going back to Jenna, is public trust. Without public trust, you can't do anything with the vaccine. And this is why what we're doing today is the beginning of a long road. Let's put all information on the table. Public trust is the key. Let, let me just add, uh, my dear friend, uh, um, the, I know this is going to be very demanding on the Ministry of Health, but we intend to get small groups like the leaders, leaders of the Evangelical Association, all the religious leaders, because they have an audience every Saturday, every Sunday. So. Uh, we are thinking that um, we'll have to have many more of these sessions. This, uh, I assure you, this is the first of many, as um, Dr. Simon would have mentioned, um, because we have the conviction that we can succeed in persuading the people of Antigua and Bar Barbuda. I recall in this very room when there was a lot of uh, skepticism on HPV vaccine, and it was in the media. And we invited the media and had a discussion. And then we didn't hear about it after. And we had the parents who bring their children in to be um, immunized. So um, I'm confident that with the information and what we're doing, we'll eventually be able to persuade the majority of people in Antigua and Barbuda. So we have a strategy to do so. Someone else? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Nurse Coates, Superintendent of Public Health Nurses, acting. My question is just for some clarification um, with regards to the vaccines. I know that two doses will be required. However, going forward, would it be like seasonal, just like the flu vaccine, or we would have to get a vaccine every season? That's my question. As of, as of right now, there's no way to know. As of right now, there's no way to know. Time will tell us. There's no way to know. It might be like tetanus. You might need a booster in 10, or it might be a flu shot you need every year. We, we don't know. We'll have to see. I think we've fielded the questions from, from the online forum and in the room. So I think we will move uh, to close, just to thank the presenters once again, those online and those in the room. And I'd like to call Sister Margaret Smith to do our closing remarks for today. Mr. Chairman, Honorable Minister of Health, Wellness, and the Environment, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health, other senior technical officers, other members of the health head table, uh, both in the room and those who are, have zoomed in, senior technical officers in the Ministry of Health, members of the media, Everyone who has joined this forum via Zoom and other media, I'm sure that you will agree that it would not be hyperbolic of me to describe this forum to discuss COVID-19 vaccines 
availability. Less than one year since the first case of the disease was announced as epical, and to know that developing countries like ours would be well, well positioned to access these life-saving medical supplies. Within the next few months, it's truly momentous when viewed in the context of the historical nature of this ongoing global pandemic. Full recognition and gratitude must be accorded to the good use of science and technology in this instance, which has made possible in less than one year something which normally takes more than a decade to be realized, if at all. As was described and emphasized, vaccines save millions of lives each year. They work by training and preparing the body's natural defenses, that is our immune system, to recognize and fight off the viruses and bacteria they target. If the body becomes exposed to these harmful disease causing germs later, the body is immediately ready to destroy them, thus preventing illness, or at minimum, preventing serious illness and death. Small developing countries like ours would normally be, be at a disadvantage to uh, procure, the, uh, compared to the, de the developed world, such as the US and the UK and others, but for the forward thinking of the World Health Organization, WHO, and partners working toward making the vaccines available through to these countries through a global procurement mechanism known as mentioned previously as the COVAX facility in conjunction with, with the Advanced Market Commitment or AMC, which is the financing instrument that will support the participation of 92 lower and middle income economies in the COVAX facility. As mentioned previously also, the COVAX AMC will be critical to ensuring equitable access by all participating countries of which Antigua and Barbuda is one to the COVID vaccines, regardless of income level. Healthcare professionals in general value vaccines in preventing, know the value rather, of vaccines in preventing infectious diseases, many of which are not so well known today, such as were mentioned by the chief medical officer, pertussis, mums, rubella, polio, and others. And this is because of the effective use of vaccines. Nurses in particular, who play a key role in countries' immunization programs, are passionate about vaccines, especially at the primary care level of our healthcare system. Nurses will be expected to continue to play that role with the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, COVID vaccine administration. As we are aware, or may be aware, the year 2020 has been designated as the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife by the World Health Assembly, WHA. The premise of this WHA's declaration is based on the critical role that nurses and midwives have played and will continue to play in countries' sustainable development as it relates to the health and well-being of individuals, families, and communities, with emphasis at the primary care level, where preventive care is the primary focus, which includes the prevention 
of infectious diseases through the use of vaccines. Nurses have played a key role on the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic so far, and will be expected to continue to do so with the administration of this life-saving vaccine when it becomes available. As the Chief Nursing Officer in the Ministry of Health, I would like to take this moment to, uh, this opportunity to uh, commend highly all of the nurses who have been working um, in such a dedicated manner on the front line in the care of persons who became, uh, who would have become ill with the, uh, the COVID uh, infection, COVID disease, as well as those who, those in the hospital, those at the community level, those in the, in both private and the public, public sectors who have worked tirelessly in some instances to ensure the care of persons as well as to, especially in the early part, early period of this pandemic, to reassure many of whom were quite anxious about this uh, disease that was impacting our nation. The Ministry of Health, Wellness and the en Environment welcomes the support of WHO and the Pan American Health Organization for their country, uh, continued support in the pandemic response so far, and in particular as it relates to being able to eventually acquire the COVID vaccine in establishing the necessary infrastructure and for technical support relating to the logistics necessary to ensure the safe delivery of the vaccines when it becomes available to all those who will need it. A special thank you is extended to the members of the panel of experts who so ably explained and provided the information that we all were recipient of today. For the, to the Chief Medical Officer who uh, gave an outline about the history of vaccine use in Antigua and Barbuda and all the benefits that we have seen to Dr. Simon, who explained about the mechanism through which vaccine work. Dr. Lewis, who um, means focus was on the technology and science of the vaccine. And for PAHO partners who addressed the issue of equitable, the equitably, uh, equitable delivery of safe vaccines, as well as vaccine safety in general. We are also thankful to them for answering all of the questions that were preferred based on the discussion that we have had today. This public dialogue is expected to continue as the Ministry of Health seeks to provide the public with accurate, up-to-date information about the vaccine, which is hope will help to allay some of the fears that currently exist and help them most importantly in making an informed decision about this vaccine, which is about to come on board. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nesmi. Thank you once again to the panelists for sharing their expertise. Thank you for everyone who would have come out today. And of course, this is the first of many, as we have heard. And we see that it is, at this point, a pro-choice movement. And, and of course, we want to make sure that all the difficult questions are asked, and at least they are also addressed. So until the next time, certainly may not be me, but other people, um, so we engage the public fully on this very, very important matter. Good afternoon, everyone.
So there we go, the end of the first consultation and public education exercise by the Ministry of Health on the COVID-19 vaccines, which will be rolled out, we expect, in a few months' time, certainly for the Caribbean. Of course, here, uh, well, the region is looking forward to the vaccines being rolled out, whichever the vaccine is that will be used. And uh, I'm just going to get a quick comment from uh, Minister uh, Joseph here as we wrap up uh, this uh, broadcast here. And it's been a marathon one here at the Sandals Resort. Minister, uh, your, your take on how the first consultation would have gone? Well, I'm very pleased. Um, you would have heard the presentations. And um, uh, we are, we're happy that we have the expertise in Antigua and Barbuda uh, to really um, present uh, the facts before the public in a manner that they can understand. But obviously, uh, we have a lot more work to do. Uh, since the government has decided that um, vaccine will not be mandatory but voluntary. Uh, this will only succeed with um, a good dose of education for every resident and citizen in Antigua and Barbuda. But I am confident uh, because we have been through this before with the HPV vaccine and with the rest of the world taking this um, vaccine and um, over time, you do not see the adverse impact on people's health, as some are forecasting. I think that too will build confidence. Antigua and Barbuda has already um, uh, paid up for its first allocation of uh, vaccines. And we anticipate that um, within the next few months, we might very well begin to see a rollout of that program. But I want to send a word of caution, or a message of caution. And that is, it's going to be a while before we see the vaccine program. And we are in, in my view, uh, the highest risk period since this COVID um, battle be began. And we're still going to have to do our social distancing Wearing our mask, uh, hand sanitization, wash hands frequently, and um, sanitize, build an immune system. All these things we must continue to practice. And um, so there, there, there are parallel things happening here. We have to continue to fight COVID with the old methods, the old protocols, but at the same time prepare for the vaccine. Um, Antigua will be prepared. Uh, we are de developing a, uh, some capacity in terms of um, storing vaccine. And we are doing it in a way, not only for COVID, but we are modernizing the whole process so that we have storage for vaccines, um, for, for medical benefits, for um, uh, the community, all over. So we'll have a vaccine uh, unit, uh, so to speak, with the necessary capacity. And um, in, in terms of um, our strategy with education, I think that we need to target certain groups, like the leaders of the churches, who have a captive audience on Saturdays and Sundays, they need to get the education, the information, so they can be confident in, in, um, in, in persuading their congregation of the safety and efficacy of, the, uh, of vaccines. Last night, while I was thinking of this whole exercise, I realized that almost all the adults in Antigua and Barbuda have been vaccinated as children. And it's interesting that then the parents made the decision to have their children vaccinated. But there's a level of uh, trepidation now that they have to make the decision to take a vaccine. So I do not believe it, uh, the majority of people are against vaccines. I think under these circumstances, people would like to understand a little more what it is that this vaccine will do to them. 
Especially the length of time and the, the, the short period of time, operational sure. warp speed, as the U.S. calls it, that right. it took to develop this weapon. But my research showed, um, revealed to me that um, the technology is over a decade old. The uh, messenger RNA technology is over a decade old. And it's really an advanced technology. Now, it's not the first time mankind has benefited from advanced technology. Uh, but when it comes to human health and something getting into your body, it's a different story. And so we have to be patient. I have patience for people who have doubts and who will exercise when I discuss with my senior officers that this must be done. It's because I discern that it's going to take a while to get the information to the public to persuade them that um, this, the vaccines that are being developed are safe and efficacious. And so um, I'm looking forward to the fu future engagement with the public and uh, so that by late first quarter, early second quarter of next year, when we start to roll out the vaccines, there will be wide acceptance of vaccines in Antigua and Barbuda. Okay. And in any question, quickly, Minister, which one of the vaccines is likely to be perhaps approved for Antigua? Uh, not at this moment. Um, because um, in speaking to um, health officials, uh, they think either technology uh, is safe, but the, uh, it depends on who you speak to. If you speak to the experienced nurses, they prefer the technology that they used before. And, um, that is when you inject, um, as one doctor said, um, a partially killed virus into the system, it triggers the immune response. So uh, that's the type of um, technology that's used for mums, measles, rubella, and that sort of thing. But this new technology um, is not uh, as familiar, the, the health workers are not as familiar with this new technology. But from all indications, it's a better technology, in, in the eyes of some. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a contrasting view, certainly, and, and, yeah. and, and it has divided opinions, uh, certainly. Yeah, but um, uh, we're going to have some time, over three months, uh, before it gets here to see what has happened in the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, the vaccine is, is being administered rapidly, and so, um, uh, that would be some time for us to be able to see whether or not uh, there are any adverse impacts, which I do not anticipate we'll see. Um, I have a lot of respect for science. And um, for instance, in the Fi Pfizer um, development, my understanding is that there is um, a black scientist that is involved, and um, that might allay some concerns that uh, black people are not being used as guinea pigs. But if indeed that there's going to be um, any conspiracy in this, which some people are promoting, uh, even the very people who develop the vaccine or who are taking it will be victims of their own work. <laughs> and I don't really believe that at this day, modern day and age, that um, we are going to see that level of conspiracy as they did before. They refer to the, uh, the experiment that was done on black people in 1948. Uh, I think what is um, somewhere in the South. Uh, Tuskegee. Tuskegee uh, experiment. I don't think those uh, theories can, can, can be uh, realize under these circumstances. There's too much light in the world right now, no. in my estimation. There are a lot of scientists, uh, the black scientists, that could see through these things. So I'm more optimistic. And uh, as the Minister of Health, though, um, I must express some concern for what is ahead of us for the next three, four months. And we are going to have to really uh, prevail upon the people of Antigua and Barbuda to continue to be disciplined, to be vigilant, and to follow the protocols that have held us in 
fairly good stead um, over the last nine months. Minister, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for talking with us. And certainly we look forward to more engagements, uh, certainly more of these panel discussions, and certainly as well uh, with the engagements with us uh, directly on ABS. Thank right. you so much. All really appreciate pleasure. it. All of the pleasure. Thanks. That's uh, Minister for Health, Wellness and Environment, Sir Marlon Joseph, telling us about uh, his reactions to what would have taken place here today. The first of what I expected to be quite a few uh, public consultations and public education initiatives by the ministry regarding the COVID-19 vaccine to be rolled out within a few months, as you heard the minister say, uh, by perhaps the, first, the end of the first quarter into the second quarter of 2021, uh, he expects that there will be uh, a rollout of the vaccines. So he expects that certainly be, uh, until then that there will have to be the adherence to the rules, to the protocols which have so far been implemented, uh, for example, wearing masks, washing hands, ha uh, coffin, sneeze etiquette, etc. So this has been our broadcast. Really appreciate your company uh, since uh, early this morning here at the Sandals Grand Antigua. Of course, we'll be unpacking these developments during our subsequent newscasts. I'm Garfield Burford on behalf of the entire team here at Sandals who have worked diligently to bring this broadcast to you. Thank you so much for watching and good afternoon.